Uh, good morning. Um, I'm Professor Jin Seul Kim uh, from Jeonnam National University, Korea. Uh, I'm yeah, as session chair in this class three. Uh, the class three is the topic of the class three is AI for scientific and the social challenge. So thank you for coming uh, to attending yeah, this uh, great event. The Korea AI Summit 2023 is uh, broadcasting online and lively. And then after the pinch this event, you can choose the class, uh, the cluster on the yeah, uh, homepage. So yeah, please welcome the first uh, presenter, Professor Yansen Singh is from Austria Austria and National University. Uh, she's gonna presentations from STAR to Syntax. Uh, okay, please welcome to Yan Sen Singh. Okay. Hello, uh, can you hear me well? Okay, wonderful. Uh, good morning. Uh, everybody, uh, thank you for waking up uh, so early uh, for the talk. So, um, so most of my uh, research is actually at the intersection of uh, statistics and machine learning and astronomy. But I thought I want to choose a topic that is uh, might be more aligned with uh, some of the expertise here, which is like understanding how we can uh, use the L the LLMs for uh, for science and astronomy. So let me start by uh, showing you a paragraph that we uh, generated. So uh, this is a new scientific uh, a hypothesis that we are uh, generated based on the LLMs uh, that we train. Uh, of course, uh, not uh, many people here are astronomers, but if you are uh, an astronomer, uh, this is a perfectly uh, valid PhD thesis. So if a PhD a student uh, came to me and say, I want to work on this uh, topic, I will say, well, no, it seems like a good idea. Uh, you can spend like five years uh, uh, on that. So uh, main, the, most of the, the goal of today is to walk you through like, what we have been doing to lead to this point. Um, so of course, I'm not like, working uh, alone. So I am uh, representing like, like, a group that I am leading that uh, we call ourselves the universe uh, TBD, uh, stand for the universe is to be decided. Uh, there's also sort of the uh, sentiment that we have. So in the, in the era of deep learning and large uh, language models, how should we rethink uh, about how we should do science? Uh, of course, uh, uh, the universe activity is uh, uh, 30 people, uh, consists of uh, astronomer and also a uh, computer uh, scientist. Uh, like mostly uh, co consists of uh, people like, like in my group and also like in my department. But also we are blessed by people uh, in the LLMs uh, community. And since the beginning, we have been uh, working closely with the ADS, uh, which is the main uh, database in, uh, in astronomy. Um, of course, we work with quite lots of friends and young students and also the industry a partner. So let's start by asking why do we want, want to do this? So I think this traces back to one of the cornerstone of uh, computer science, which is uh, understanding can machine things, right? So of course, science is one of the, the very uh, interesting uh, area to really tackle the question, what we have been doing in science, uh, uh, is it uh, replicable with, uh, with machines? Uh, of course, like we know that this seems to be a very uh, active area of uh, research because we have gone from uh, ELISA to you know, like GPT-4, and many things have changed in the last few years. But uh, uh, despite all this uh, advancement in large uh, language models, uh, we do know that most of the, the machine that we have is really not good at doing science. Uh, you can ask like, uh, people from Google, uh, about that, because uh, when they first uh, like, re uh, released BART, uh, they make a mistake in the astronomy uh, question, right? So they asked the question uh, about James Webb's. Uh, BART gave the answer, turned out to be wrong, because we have uh, observed the, uh, the, the first picture of planets outside the solar system is uh, detected 20 years um, uh, uh, ago. So guess what? This is what happened, right? Uh, so this uh, leads to what we what, uh, try to do because uh, there are many ge generalist uh, models uh, out there, but there are very few specialist like models. So uh, uh, this is what the, the, the universe uh, TBD try to achieve. 
And in order to be able to be uh, useful for astronomer, you basically need two things. One is to train a very po powerful base models, but you also need to align the model to do what you want to do. Uh, so, so this is also what we try to achieve in our groups. So uh, for the base, base model, uh, astronomy is a very small subfield, so uh, we are uh, to, to date the only group that's working on that. So we, we fine-tune a model based on all the uh, papers on, on archive, uh, all 300,000 uh, of them uh, based on the LAMA uh, models. We call this the Astro uh, LAMA. Uh, and all, all the models are public. Um, you might ask, why do you want to do that, right? So why do you want to train a base a model? Uh, the main goal of the, the universe of TBD consists of two goals. Uh, one is to trace the past, and the other is to forecast the future. Let's talk about why do we want to trace the past. Uh, let's face the fact that uh, science is not a very fair uh, system, and quite often we, we assign uh, credit quite unfairly. And one of the metrics that we use like, a lot is, is citation, but we also know that like, citation is really not a very good metric. So uh, this is well uh, captured in this uh, paper from PNAS. So what is uh, showing you here, the individual dots here are the uh, different subfield in, in physical uh, sciences. And the x-axis here are the numbers of a paper in the field. And the y-axis here is the Gini factors of the field meaning that do the cited paper get more cited or not? Uh, of course, uh, there is a very strong co correlation, which is uh, not surprising, because if you work in a field that is extremely large, uh, no one reads papers, and so just the cited paper get more cited like, over time. So uh, this is one thing that we think like, we can change. And what we can change, of course, is that like, if you have an LLM that can read all the papers for you and abstract uh, and extract the, uh, the semantic uh, representation of the papers, then uh, you have a hope to bypass some of this uh, a bias uh, metric. So, and of course, uh, you can only do that if you really have <laughs> an LLM that truly uh, uh, understand the field. And as we have shown, some of these uh, uh, general uh, uh, models uh, simply is not up to the task. To show you why, <coughs> uh, to show you why this is the case, so let's say if you take the GPT-3 uh, GPT uh, models and ask the cosine or similarity of any two papers. Uh, most of them, like, so these are all the two pairwise uh, cosine uh, similarity of all the 300,000 papers in astronomy. And if you ask a GPT uh, uh, embedding models, uh, they will just think that these are all astronomy uh, papers. So it, it does not understand the nuances in the field. But if you fine-tune our models, then the cosine of similarity become much broader, meaning that it believes some of the paper are more similar than the other. Uh, this is, of course, just one metric. You can look into some of the more uh, specific uh, uh, cases. So these are the two papers that, for example, the general uh, uh, model disagree with the specialized uh, models. Uh, these are the title of the two papers. Uh, both of them has the words uh, magnetized. But of course, they actually means very, very uh, different things. These are two uh, different subfields. But if you take the, the model like a GPT-3, then you will get a very high uh, cosine uh, similarity. But if you train a specialized uh, models, then you understand that these two papers are actually not the same, like despite you, you are uh, using the same words. And similarly, it also seems to capture some of the nuances. If you are astronomer, then you know that uh, looking at a nebula with the Spitzer Space uh, Telescope is looking at star formation. And if you're looking at H2 uh, region, which is the, the ionized gas of the hydrogen, you're also looking at the star uh, forming a region. So uh, GPT have no idea these two papers are the same, but actually some uh, specialized uh, uh, model will do uh, pretty well. So this is just showing you that uh, there is a need to, to really train a specialized uh, models. But that's not what we want to achieve, right? So there are lots of things you can do with this type of things. One is to, uh, vi to, to visualize the, the landscape based on the semantic, uh, l l uh, rather than the keywords. So it will help the stakeholder uh, to decide what we should like, invest on. But also, it just makes uh, things much uh, easier for scientists. So uh, this is a fun, fun application that we just built. So for example, you can put in a paragraph, or you can upload a PDF. Uh, and we will do the citation for you, or we will uh, recommend some uh, references uh, for you based on the semantic of the, your papers. 
with the co correlation of all the other papers uh, instead of just you know like citing your friends, right? Uh, so, uh, but more importantly, that's one fun application. But ultimately, what we try to 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 ask is to understand the evolution of the field. So we have done that. I say in uh, Google uh, uh, and Graham has done the, a similar thing like 15 years ago. But now we have the LLM, so you can start to understand how the field uh, evolved over time. And you can start to build quite a lot of uh, in insights based on the intersection between the like, LLM and science. So uh, this is the field about cosmology, dark matter, and dark, uh, uh, dark, uh, dark energy. If you look at uh, the trend of this field, uh, so the y-axis here shows you the fractional uh, of uh, papers that are related to this uh, concept. But importantly, here we are not based on keywords, so, so we are based on the uh, semantic uh, representation of the papers. So you can see that uh, this field is, was uh, quite popular in the 1990s. Uh, that's where Jim Peebles uh, did his work and won the Nobel Prize. But of course, uh, without the data, uh, the field started to die. And after the first uh, Sloan uh, Digital Sky uh, Survey get uh, 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 launched and uh, released their first uh, data, this field become popular uh, uh, again. And over time, things uh, start to uh, uh, saturate. So this is a very simple metric, but it helps you to understand how this field has uh, evolved uh, over time. Uh, to show you another like, like obvious one, so all people know James Webb. So uh, James Webb has uh, not much uh, publicity like, until it get launched, and then it get become very, very uh, popular. Uh, but the other things that are even is a, a surprising for, for me. So we always think that in astronomy, may, maybe uh, machine learning become popular in the last uh, five years. But turn out that uh, this is also not the case. So if you look at the, the, the paper based on semantic, uh, there was a wave uh, in the 1990s, but of course it got uh, like forgotten. So this also means that like, lots of things in science that you get are uh, reinvented all the time, but be, being a, able to extract the insights and evolution is actually quite, quite important. Uh, of course, there are lots of fun things you can do with like, this type of cross-section. Cross, cross uh, so in astronomy, we have this uh, fun uh, review that's called the annual uh, review, uh, which is a big thing. So if you are invited to uh, write a, uh, a, a annual uh, review, you are, are guaranteed to have like 3,000 uh, citations. But of course, uh, uh, there's a reason why it's called the annual uh, review, because uh, the, uh, people will ask some uh, famous people to write the review, and then it will take like one year or more. Uh, until they are finished the review. But now you do not need to do that, right? So we have like, released some fun things on Slack. So you can just uh, install that on your Slack, and any postdoc and student can ask a question about you know, where to find the oldest star in the Milky Way, and then it, it will uh, summarize the latest in the field uh, for you. Of course, this become quite, quite helpful for young students or uh, uh, institutions that are not well uh, resourced. So hopefully the market will go better. Well, of course, uh, that is sort of like, like tracing the past, but that's not the main goal of what we try to do because uh, as I mentioned uh, uh, in the beginning, the key question is, can a machine think? Can the machine uh, replicate what we do as a scientist? And that's, uh, that's what I meant by tracing the future. Can the machine come up with a hy hypothesis in science that is uh, robust and also quite uh, creative? And this is something that we have been doing a lot, but of course, this uh, you, you cannot just train a base of models because all, all this requires quite a lot of the alignment. Uh, so this uh, plot kind of uh, summarizes what we have been thinking in terms of the alignment. So in order for a scientific uh, hypothesis to be uh, robust, you need to uh, satisfy a few cri criteria. So the first one, of course, you need to be robust, right? So you try not to, to hallucinate and try to not to make up stuff. Uh, this is not too hard to do because we have like, extracted the semantic uh, representation of all, all the papers. So you can always check if what you say do have some uh, relevant uh, papers in what has been uh, written. But being just uh, robust is not uh, enough to say the idea is good. So we also try to do like, different things to make sure that things are, for example, more fluid. So you can get the idea from a, a different field, but you want to make sure that all these uh, ideas are pieced together uh, uh, in a way uh, that is co coherent and uh, interesting. 
So for the fluidity, actually what we find is that the adversarial prompting is quite good. Uh, so I show you the one of the hypotheses that uh, we generated. That is after a few uh, iteration of self uh, critics. So you can have an LLMs that uh, provide the ideas, and you have you can have the other like LLMs as your teacher or your supervisor that try to uh, criticize your ideas. Importantly, of course, your supervisor and your critics are, are also need to like criticize based on fact, and you cannot just uh, do that say with the GPT-4. So the large uh, language uh, models here also have access to the uh, vector. A database. So when you try to like criticize your idea, you also need to go through to give you the correct like references to try to you know think about what is the weaknesses of this. And this is something that the people in astronomy get quite excited because we all hate uh, our, our referee, and uh, this is the one way to also like overcome not the citation but also have the referee uh, like system that is uh, somewhat more fair. Uh, but after a few iterations, actually things can get quite strong and. Uh, so, so what we have done, of course, uh, there's no ground like ground truth in your ideas, but we sent out some of these hy uh, hypotheses for experts to grade. Uh, so on the y-axis here is showing you the grades from the human, the, 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 the experts, and the x-axis here is showing you the context that we gave to the LLMs. So on the left-hand side, the dark green here is showing you that if I do not have uh, critics, then just like a student that have no supervisor, you can read as many papers as you want. Uh, it might not come up with a, a, a better uh, ideas. But if you have uh, self-critics, uh, then uh, things get uh, better over time based on the context and the idea that uh, you can draw from. You can also uh, visualize why things become better because we have all the uh, semantic uh, representation. So here showing you when you first uh, generate the ideas, which paper and idea you draw the ideas from. Of course, then the, the critic will go outside the convex hull of your ideas and say, well, you know, you should also con consider the, the other points. And it's by this self-like criticism that the hypothesis will try to enlarge the convex hull and try to uh, encompass a, a bigger base of idea that try to impress the critics. Right? Of course, uh, th this will... and uh, ensure things are fluid, but of course we also know that self-critics itself might not give you a loss of uh, creativity. It's just well, well, making things sound like better and more, more coherent. The more difficult thing here in, uh, in, in scientific uh, hypothesis uh, generation with LLM is really the trade-off uh, between uh, fidelity and creativity. So if you are really, really like, uh, robust, just follow what people have done, by definition, uh, you are not a creative. But if you are really creative, then uh, you might also be uh, have the danger to you know, go off tangent. So we have been also thinking a lot about how we do science, like what is the best way to create a very creative idea. So the ideas that we have been like, like mulling over, so these are quite all new. It just are uh, coming out with a lot of small, small ideas, like three, three, three sentences like a thousand of them, and then you use the LLM to grade all these thousand small ideas and collect the top 15 or 20 and try to make them into a, a, a better uh, idea. So these are of course all new. Like, so, so all the things that I presented like, like happened in the last six months. Um, of course, uh, this is uh, somewhat uh, a preliminary, but we do find that this idea of just uh, the evolution of ideas come completely just within the LLMs. It's actually quite powerful. So if you can just collect small ideas and build into a complex like idea, uh, it works pretty well. In fact, if you compare to uh, what we do, so, so this is a blind test, a pairwise uh, blind test. And if you compare what is uh, generated with what we call real, real just meaning that we take a paper and try to summarize the question that is being uh, answered in the paper. So as if the research uh, had, has not been done, uh, in a blind test, the, the hypogen, we call that the hypothesis uh, a generation, uh, works uh, pretty well. Uh, it also works uh, uh, better than few shot, and also, of course, uh, a zero shot with GPT-4. Um, so these are, of course, all, all very new for young people in the room. Uh, this uh, movie is called The Jurassic Park. Uh, so uh, we can do a lot of things, but the question is uh, whether or not uh, we should do that. So especially in the uh, scientific 
uh, community, uh, there's a danger about all this are murmuring about, you know, like, like, like can an AI re really do the job that we do as an uh, astronomer? And uh, this leads to my uh, philosophical takes of uh, what I think. Uh, first of all, I think it's entirely possible that we can recreate what we do as a scientist. I think we somehow overvalue our, our intellect. So we feel like things like, like mathematics or physics are so profound that you know, like no machine can replicate. But I don't think uh, that's the right uh, sentiment, right? Because all the things that we do with the frontal lobes is quite young. So just remind you that the frontal lobes is only like, like, a, like a million years old uh, compared to the motor uh, motion, which is much more difficult. So, so all these uh, intellectual activity is entirely uh, possible, even like in the realm of what we call like creativity in science. I don't think it's uh, something that is, cannot be uh, replicated with machine. The question is whether or not you, you should do that. And I think yes, because uh, I remember, I love to play chess, I still play chess. And I remember when uh, Deep Blue first beat uh, Kasparov, or people just say, well, you know, we shouldn't play chess uh, anymore. So, so, so what is the point of uh, uh, playing chess? I think we're also getting uh, very close to the same like, scenario, right? So we love doing, say, science as an intellectual uh, activity, but that's not means that even in one day, the AI have, we have an AI a scientist that can do a better science than we do. We will still do science. It's just a very fun uh, intellectual uh, activity. In fact, I would, would argue that since the uh, inception of AI in chess, it actually makes the field uh, better because now the power are not only allocated to the strong country, but rather all people can play chess like equally well because you have the, the best uh, uh, guidance uh, no matter where you are at. So the goal of what is just to you know like uh, uh, democratize uh, uh, democratize uh, the field. This is uh, particularly uh, important for astronomy because astronomy is a very very like expensive field more so than the other. So this is why it's always the power is always very concentrated uh, in the field uh, institution. Uh, and this can break the loops. Um, of course, I am uh, representing the astronomy and science, but the question is why astronomy? Not, why not chemistry or like particle physics, right? I think there are a few key, key advantages of, of astronomy com compared to the rest of the field. First of all is that no harm can be done, right? If you work on, uh, like no one can die from this. So if you do a uh, bio, a medical research and build your hypothesis based on your AI, I think there will be a lot of uh, concern. But in astronomy, there is absolutely no financial like, incentive. There's absolutely no uh, uh, liability, right? So that's one of the main, main, main attraction. Uh, it's also why I do astronomy. Um, and the other is that like, astronomy really have a very well uh, curated uh, literature. Uh, perhaps it's the best in all the physical sciences, because I also work with people in geophysics, they are really far from you know the well like curation that we have, and also all, we we have the open sky policy. Mo almost all data are open source. If they are not, uh, there will be open source like within a uh, one year. And also, astronomy has a very long history. I, I think that this is something that has not been well uh, appreciated. If you look at many subfields in physics, uh, there is a rise and a fall quite quickly. The thing about the nuclear uh, physics, it got like popular in the 1920s, become not as uh, popular like, after like 1950s. But astronomy has been like quite popular from you know like 1940s to now, meaning that if you want to test some idea like whether or not you can auto regressively uh, generate new ideas, we have a very long time time baseline, and this makes things are uh, quite uh, possible. So I I would like, argue that if you want to Think about the idea of a AI a scientist. The first thing that could work and should work is astronomy, because of all these key advantages that uh, the other uh, subfield uh, might not have. Uh, I will say thank you, and we'll leave you with the last slide. Take question. Thank you. Um, anyone have a question? Professor uh, thank you for a great talk. 
And I have uh, two questions. First, uh, you proposed uh, so using large language model for uh, uh, proposing new hypothesis. Yeah. And, and my understanding is it's similar to retrieval-based language model. And does your approach also work with the new, uh, I mean, updated database? Or because every year there are new papers. So yeah. do you think your model just seems to work with uh, new update with the literature, or you need to tune your model? And second, my, uh, in generative AI, actually, evaluation is very important. And yeah. so I was surprised that actually the hypogen uh, yeah. works better than Lear. <laughs> and right. can you explain why it's possible? Right. So uh, on the update, of course, right? So you, you want to keep, keep updating. But like, astronomy is also in an interesting scenario where some of the key, it has a very long baseline. also means that things uh, happen at a longer time scale. Or you can say the field moves slower. So it's not like machine learning that you need to keep up. Like everything is outdated after like three, three months, right? But astronomy have a slower lifetime. Also means that the update uh, time scale is longer. Of course, yeah, you need to update. This is another key advantage of doing astronomy. And also on the ideas, of course, the evaluation is always like a problem in, in, in every science because uh, uh, all people have their opinion, and all people think that your research are not as interesting as theirs. Uh, that's all, always a problem. But what is really like, if you look at like what is uh, generated by the bots like, versus the human, you really have the strength of just knowing the idea more broadly. I think one of like, when I grade so so, so I grade like, like some of this like myself, I always rank that like higher because you simply have read more more papers uh, than my students. We are also in the, it's also a very interesting subfield where like, astronomy is always like connecting the dots. The physical uh, processes is quite similar, so it's not uncommon that like, people work on stars and they work on black holes and then galaxy. And the fact that you are able to read like lots of papers and, and put them in a co coherent way is very like attractive for astronomy. So uh, this might not be exactly true, say, for things like in mathematics. But you need to dive like re really deep into that. Uh, it's also one of the very interesting. So 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 it, again, it's just a field that I think works quite well with LLM. Yeah. Thank you. Oh yeah, another question up there. Yeah, I'm very interesting talk. Uh, what I understand about the language model is good for. Create creative writing, yeah, but it's not good for uh, the question answering, right? Because always it generates some yeah. the disinformation for yeah. uh, hallucination, right? So your talk is never mentioned about hallucination. Yeah, but <laughs> so also because we talk about that. yeah, because we all always like uh, refer to the vector uh, database, so we kind of always draw from real like real papers. So this is the trade-off, like like between our creativity and fidelity. Yeah. So I understand the even uh, retrieval augmented yeah. uh, generative model yeah. generate hallucination. Right. Although that is a, the, the hallucinate number of hallucination is reduced, right. but still there's a possibility of generate hallucination. You said that it's a scientific area. Right. It, it One mistake is yeah. the digester, right? Yeah, it tends to hallucinate in, like, I have seen some of this uh, generation, it hallucinate in a way that is not that critical. So, for example, it will say, we should look at the large uh, Magellan Atlantic cloud for these reasons. And, and then you say, we have observed, like, 3,000 stars in that galaxy, which is not true. So, like, these, like, little, like, minor, like, details, it tends to still hallucinate. But the overall picture, it tends not to hallucinate too much. But also means that it probably is not as uh, creative as we want it to be. It's still yeah, confined. I, I to agree that, that uh, you are, it's okay to generating hypotheses. Yeah, but, but if you write, I'm paper, still some yeah. <laughs> yeah. some reservation. Yeah. Right? So so the ultimate idea matches the ultimate goal is really have uh, multi uh, agents. So the body we're training is more, mostly for the hypothesis, but really hope that. There are bots that will write the code and script the data and do like end to end. So, so this is the very first step of what we call the AI scientist, which we believe you cannot do that with one LLMs. You, you, you probably have the, the multi uh, agents to do that. Uh, we are inching towards that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, 
Yeah, Professor Yan Sen Sen, uh, thank you for your great presentation and then great yeah, response. So, yeah, would you please have a use? Thank you. Your yeah, next presentation uh, is a Professor uh, Jae Young Shim from University, uh, uh, UNIST, uh, yeah, of University. Uh, he's going to talk, talk about the space of observation intelligence. So please welcome to Professor uh, Jae Young Shim. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Kim, for your nice introduction. So good morning, everyone. So today uh, I'm going to talk about the, our research uh, regarding space observation intelligence. So our group is a, a kind of a sub-research group in AI Innovation Hub project. Okay, let me first briefly uh, introduce the overview of our project. So the, uh, as you can see right here, there are many telescopes and every day we have the lots of data of, uh, to observe the space. So however, the, considering this uh, huge amount of data, the current uh, techniques are quite simple to analyze such data. So the uh, general purpose of our project is to develop some AI models and techniques which are uh, specialized to this uh, space observation big data. Uh, and in particular, we consider three uh, large topics. The first one, uh, we'd like to develop some AI techniques uh, to enhance the quality of images uh, for space observation. So you can see that in the right uh, below side, uh, when we uh, take the images for the deep space, as well as the uh, remote sensing images, uh, there might be various uh, sources of noises or according to the capturing environment, the quality of images may be degraded. So uh, enhancing the, the such quality may improve the understanding of our uh, deep space analysis. And also the uh, various modalities of time series data is obtained. So we uh, also developed some AI based technique for to analyze such a time series data uh, to uh, help to discover the unusual object in the space, something like that. Uh, and also in the astronomy field, the analyzing the shape or uh, attribute of a galaxy is quite important. So we developed some AI-based classification technique uh, for galaxy, uh, galaxy shapes and attributes. Okay, so uh, the this, this research has some challenges because basically uh, when we want to develop some AI techniques, we need to consider its data. So the space observation data has uh, several uh, characteristics. The first, it is extremely massive. So the telescopes generate the uh, lots of data every day. However, in order to efficiently process such data, we need to provide some meaningful information. So usually the human expert, such as astronomers, manually label some, uh, some specific objects uh, uh, from, from this space observation data. So considering the total amount of data, the uh, amount of such uh, reliable labels are very small. And also the obtained data has some inherent noise because for example, if we take some satellite images due to some clouds or some haze on the earth, uh, the quality of the image may be degraded. And also, even if you take the deep space images, so we can also have some, uh, the, the telescope capturing uh, environment or device problems, we can have some noise. And also, the, uh, there are uh, multi-modal multi uh, types of uh, space observation data. So for example, we can take the time series data or take some uh, image data across the uh, different spectral bands and so on. So the uh, handling such large of data by using some manual processing by human experts or applying a uh, simple machine learning techniques uh, may have some limitations in, in terms of accuracy or efficiency. 
So in this research, uh, we'd like to develop some specialized AI models to uh, handle and process such types of uh, space observation data uh, in more uh, detail. Uh, and then it may help to uh, solve some unknown scientific problems in the astronomy field. Okay, here shows our research team. Uh, as you may know that, uh, we need some uh, domain experts as well to do this work. So first we have some uh, specialists in AI field. Uh, the, most of them have some background of computer science and electrical engineering. Uh, and also we have some specialists in astronomy, astronomy field as well. So the professors are majoring in physics and astronomy. And also we are working with some companies in the industry. So for example, SIA is a, uh, the, the well-known company to analyze some satellite images. Okay, then uh, today I'd like to uh, show some, uh, some example uh, research works. The first one is reference-based super resolution via domain adaptation in remote sensing. So this work has been uh, performed by Professor Jejun Yu in, uh, at UNIST. Okay, this work is about remote sensing. So uh, 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 recently we are applying the various deep learning techniques to process remote sensing data. So for example, uh, from the satellite images, we'd like to figure out the uh, buildings or vegetation areas by performing some semantic labeling. And also we can detect some specific uh, objects from the satellite images. And then by uh, analyzing this information across the time, we can also perform some change detection as well. So these are the uh, actively researched, uh, researched topic in nowadays. Uh, however, the uh, important point is the quality of obtained images. So the, uh, but usually we have some low quality images for the, uh, to, uh, uh, for the space observation data. However, the improving its quality uh, in other words, improving its resolution is quite important uh, because the high quality, uh, be because the quality or resolution of source images are degraded, it may affect the performance of a downstream task, right? Uh, but uh, the, uh, relative to the current cameras uh, in, uh, we are using uh, our daily lives, uh, the space observation images are obtained from some specific cameras which can be operated in the space, right? So for example, if we want to uh, increase its resolution twice uh, in a hardware sense, then uh, it may uh, require the high cost, about up to 30 times higher cost. So we uh, consider to develop some uh, super resolution technique uh, by using the AI in this remote sensing application. So if you are familiar to the computer vision field, uh, the, the, you, you might be familiar to the concept of a super resolution. The super resolution can be uh, largely categorized into the single image based resolution, uh, super resolution and reference based super resolution. So uh, in the uh, single image case, we, we only take a single low resolution image and then uh, improve its resolution by, by uh, extracting some features, exploiting the features by using dim networks. Uh, on the other hand, the reference-based super resolution case, uh, we, uh, in addition to the input low resolution image, we uh, uh, exploit some external reference image. Usually uh, it is a high quality. So uh, in general, we, uh, it can provide the uh, more higher performance than the single image super resolution case. So for example, here, uh, it shows some uh, uh, research of example techniques of super resolution. Uh, the, as you can see that the use in general, the reference based super resolution uh, provides the higher performance compared to the single image based uh, super resolution. Uh, however, uh, in order to uh, exploit the benefit of reference image, uh, we need to assume some uh, assume that the similarity between input image and reference image. So uh, as, you can, as you can see from the left figures, 
Uh, this is an, uh, th these are the images extracted from the CU FED5 data set. Uh, the, the, they, they are some extracted adjacent frames from the video sequences. So as you can see that uh, the input image and the reference image has a very similar characteristics, similar properties. So in such a case, we can, uh, we can boost the benefit of reference-based super resolution. So its performance is uh, relatively higher than the single image-based super resolution. Uh, but in the right, -hand, right case, uh, these are the images extracted from WR and SR data set. And in such a case, the input image and reference image, even though its same contents are the same, however, uh, the images exhibit some uh, dissimilar characteristics, right? So if there is a domain gap, such a high domain gap, the uh, performance gain of a reference-based super resolution is relatively low compared to the left case. But this situation is uh, come out emphasized in the remote sensing case as well. So here, as you can see that, uh, the, the, uh, the images uh, in the remote sensing case, we are taking uh, multimodal images. So for example, we are taking images at the visible light band, as well as the infrared light band or other light band, or some images are reconstructed from uh, the receive the signal by, by radar signals, right? So there are quite uh, various types of uh, images in remote sensing case. So uh, in order to improve the quality of uh, a certain low resolution image by using an, another model, uh, modality of high resolution reference image, we, we may have a, a huge domain gap, right? So we need to overcome this domain gap to uh, develop the reference-based super resolution technique. So this is a general overview of reference-based super resolution technique. So we have the low resolution input image and a relatively high resolution reference image. So uh, we first compute the correspondence matching between two images. And then uh, by using this, uh, this uh, matching information, we extract the features from the reference image and uh, exploit this feature to generate the high quality image from the uh, input low resolution image. So in our research, uh, we perform the uh, boosting the matching performance as well as bo uh, boosting the feature transfer uh, performance. So first, in the remote sensing case, uh, as I said before, the uh, input images and reference images are often uh, is some dissimilar characteristics. Now, color is an important uh, domain gap, source of domain gap. So we perform some uh, grayscale transform in order to alleviate the effect of a color to uh, compute the correspondence matching. So, and then, uh, and also, when we extract some D features from the high resolution reference image, uh, we also use the low resolution image as well. So uh, we perform some uh, star, trans uh, star transfer technique to extract more, uh, more similar features from the reference image in order to uh, improve the input image. Okay, here shows some uh, uh, qualitative results of matching performance. So if we apply the uh, grayscale transform technique in order to improve the matching performance, uh, as you can see that here, uh, the first column shows the input low resolution image, and the second column shows the uh, reference high resolution image. So as you can see that these two images is a quite dissimilar color characteristics, right? Uh, but the compared to the third column, uh, which is performed without grayscale uh, transform matching, uh, by using this uh, grayscale transform matching uh, as shown in the first column, you can see that the, uh, the, the uh, structures, the detailed structures are faithfully preserved here. Okay, and then uh, in terms of a feature transform, uh, feature transfer, we basically use the whitening color transform, which are uh, widely used in the arbitrary style transfer applications. So we uh, regard the uh, reference image 
as a content, and then the input low resolution image as a style, right? So we convert the style of uh, content image according to the input style images. However, when we uh, directly apply this uh, whitening color transform technique to uh, this application, as you can see that some uh, structural uh, degradation is observed here, right? So in order to overcome this uh, structural uh, deformation, uh, we additionally consider the phase replacement technique. So uh, here, uh, when the content image is style transferred, so we, uh, we, we consider its amplitude and phase component respectively, right? And then maintaining the amplitude of the uh, style image, uh, uh, style, uh, style feature maps, while the replacing the phase information only, we can uh, more, uh, we can preserve the, uh, the original scene structures more faithfully. And here is the uh, overall architecture, which combines the uh, whitening color transform and phase replacement together. And this shows the qualitative result for super resolution. So <clears throat> note that the proposed method is a kind of some uh, generalized post-processing method. So we can, uh, our method can be adopted to the existing super resolution technique. Uh, in order to boost the uh, matching performance and uh, feature transfer performance as well. So here, the, uh, the upper figures shows the result of existing super resolution technique, and it's uh, just the below images uh, shows the result when, uh, with the uh, addition of a proposed method as a plug-in way. So you can see that the more uh, the, in, in the super resolution results, is a more faithful, uh, faithful when you apply the proposed method compared to the existing ones. And in terms of a quantitative performance, the uh, proposed method also improves, improves the uh, PSNL and SSIM, uh, SSIM gains uh, as shown in these tables. And also, these are, these are the final quantitative result of super resolution performance. Also, we observe some gains in terms of super resolution. Okay, then uh, let me introduce the, another work, which is called the Galaxy Classification with Deformable Attention Transform. Uh, this, the, this research has been performed by Professor uh, Taewan Kim at uh, UNIST uh, with the, uh, the, the help of uh, Dr. Min Soo Shin from Korea Aerospace and Sp uh, the Space Science Institute. Okay, so uh, as I said before, the galaxy classification is an important task in astronomy field. Uh, however, the, up to now, the, most of the prior works just to consider some course level classification. So for example, here from an image, uh, uh, from the image of skies, uh, we can detect some uh, specific objects. And then usually we detect the stars and galaxies, right? So we classify which one is star and which one is galaxy. And also for the galaxies, we, uh, cl uh, we classify its, uh, its attribute, for example, whether it is a smooth or, smooth or disk. So these are a simple binary classification test, right? So at the early stage of our project, the, another, uh, our another group uh, is also working to improve the classification performance uh, uh, between uh, stars and galaxies. But at the same time, the uh, Professor Taewan Kim's group are uh, focusing to develop the uh, relatively new uh, problem. So uh, they focus on fine-grained galaxy classification problem. So as you can see that here, uh, capital E means the elliptical shape, right? So 
the, you can see that some elliptical galaxies here. However, <clears throat> even the galaxy is cla classified into, uh, as a elliptical shape, uh, its shapes are also can be more uh, cl uh, classified as well, according to the, uh, um, uh, 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 for example, whether it is uh, more circular or more elliptical, something like that. And also, uh, capital S means a spider. So uh, co uh, compared to the elliptical case, we can detect them some spider galaxies as well. But as you can see here, there are also some specific types of spiders. So for example, this is a typical spider, has a very circular center. But in the below figure, this is a spider galaxy. However, there is a kind of some bald shape here. But uh, accurately classifying such fine-grained galaxy types is a quite challenging task because uh, data set is highly unbalanced. Because up to now, uh, we don't uh, uh, rigorously categorize or process the data set for this task. And also, some foreground objects may accrue some target galaxy would like to classify. And also, uh, some raw data may have some invalid information. So uh, we need to tackle these challenges to solve this problem. So we first build our own data set to do this one. So the uh, original uh, source of these galaxy images are from the uh, Hubble sequences, uh, which is from Amiga or EFIGI or uh, Nair and Abraham data sets. And then by uh, taking these low images, we crop some uh, uh, we crop some local images by uh, uh, centering the target galaxies like this here, and then uh, by using some tools, we can also provide some mask binary mask which uh, highlight the region of a galaxy, and also in the third image you can see that the uh, 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 non-value data mask here. So th this is a kind of some absence of information. So we combine all these types of information together, uh, and then the, the, the crop such types of local images, we generate our own data set, and its statistics are shown here. So for example, here capital E means the elliptical gal galaxy, and uh, S -Z SO or SAB, SC, there are uh, fine-grained types of spiral galaxies as well. But here, as you can see that uh, some, some classes may have some relatively small number of data uh, samples, while the SAB class has a, a relatively large number of training data set as well. So such an imbalance of a data set is a kind of some huddle to solve this problem. So in our preliminary work, we applied the concept of a deformable attention transformer to address this problem. Because as you can see that the uh, galaxy has a very diverse shapes, right? So, and then we'd like to classify these shapes uh, in a more rigorous way. So we uh, apply some adaptive attention, uh, deformable attention by using this architecture. Here shows some experimental results. Uh, the the uh, uppercase, the baseline is the result of simply applying the deformable attention transformer. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, in order to overcome the class imbalance problem, uh, we applied some fixed match or DSD technique in a semi-supervised manner. Right, so we can uh, observe some amount of gain uh, in terms of accuracy. And here shows the uh, confusion matrix. So in the y-axis, you can see that the ground truth and x-axis is a predicted output. So diagonal components yields some desired outputs, right? However, you can see that uh, from the right images right here, the E-class galaxy is shown here, but the S0 types of galaxies are shown here. So it is quite difficult, even for human experts, to classify E types galaxy or S0 types of galaxy. So, so uh, in this case, it's also similarly observed in this confusion matrix as well. So for example, here, uh, the, 
uh, the, the E types and S0 types uh, cr cross uh, section yields some relatively high values. So our research uh, demonstrate that the result of uh, AI technique is quite similar to that of human, uh, uh, human classification research. Okay, so this technique uh, has been also presented in yesterday as a spotlight presentation, right? Okay, okay this is the end of my talk. Uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, anyone have a question? If you have a question, please raise your hand and we'll pass the microphone. Mm, yeah. Okay, I have a question for you. Mm. I think. <laughs> Actually, I'm not a research uh, you know, profess, you know, professional in this area, but I think we've been studying uh, the universe, I mean, the space and galaxy uh, for a very long time. And uh, there is still a lot of working uh, to be done. So also, it has recently become a more uh, important Field of uh, in, uh, research. So, um, what is the the, the main uh, challenging issue in this uh, uh, some galaxy, I suppose, space? If we apply the AI. Uh, yes, for uh, for the galaxy classific classification test, the uh, one of the. Uh, 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 professors in our group are also working for course level classification tests. So, for example, from the uh, whole sky images, uh, we first detect the star and galaxy, right? And from the galaxy, we can extract some whether its type is a smooth or disk, something like that. So, this is, this is a quite uh, relatively simple classification test because the labels is binary labels. But the uh, the the uh, the fine grained galaxy classification test. Uh, as I said before, there are some uh, uh, several challenges because first one is that there is no uh, widely used data set. So to do this research, our research group uh, builds our own data set by processing the uh, provided the sky images, right? And also uh, after processing and building our own data set, we observed that the class imbalance is a quite uh, a critical problem to address this uh, 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 to address this problem. So we apply some concepts of uh, semi-supervised learning manner by uh, additionally using some uh, techniques which is widely used in the machine learning area. So at current stage, we are applying some existing machine learning technique to solve this problem. But I think that uh, in the later, we need to develop the uh, somewhat specialized uh, uh, semi-supervised learning techniques, uh, which is, uh, uh, dedicated to this uh, uh, galaxy data set as well in the future. Okay, good. Uh, thank you for a great presentation and then uh, good uh, response. All right. Uh, yeah, Professor Sim, uh, yeah, please uh, yeah, move to your have seat and then. Uh, we finish actually this uh, this session, class three. Uh, so after twenty minutes, uh, maybe yeah, eleven twenty-five. Yeah, the class new session is gonna be coming in this space. So um, anyway, uh, the two presenter uh, and then all of attending the offline and online. Uh, we thank. Uh, I'm saying, so please, uh, yeah, everyone, to thank you very much. Okay, I'll see you after 25 minutes, okay? Thank you. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome.
to the second day of the Korea AI Summit 2023. And please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Jiang Jessica Park, and I've given the privilege to host today's conference. First and foremost, I would like to thank everyone for joining us here today out of your busy schedule. Under the theme of AI-powered innovation, this conference aims to offer an opportunity for us to explore and understand the present and future of artificial intelligence as well as its related challenges. And this year, uh, we are pleased to be joined by industry-leading experts at Home and Abroad. And following yesterday's conference, uh, there will be two keynote speech and a panel discussion. Today's conference is being broadcast on our YouTube channel, and I'm pleased to join by uh, those of you who are joining us online. Thank you very much, and also I hope you find this conference very helpful. All right, so we must get started. Uh, for that, I would like to invite our third keynote speaker. Uh, th the third keynote speaker is Mr. John Ponce. He'll be talking about Beyond the Computer Vision Comfort Zone. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome me with a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. I'm, um, I'm very honored to be here and very happy to be here. Um, so I'm going to talk about computer vision beyond the comfort zone and we'll try to explain what it means. This is joint work with a lot of people and I have many hats as well. Uh, before I start the technical stuff, I wanted to say that I'm part of a French, a French uh, AI program called Prairie that is in Paris. So it's, a, it's an AI institute with uh, a mixture of uh, academia and industry, and we are always we have a bunch of international collaborators. We are always looking for more. So, of course, Korea is a is a perfect uh, candidate for us. So, if you are interested, please please talk to me. All right. So, I'm going to talk about mostly about two things. I'm going to talk about uh, photography, and I'm going to talk about astronomy. Uh, and if I have time, which I doubt, I will talk a little bit about uh, video prediction at the end. And if I run uh, late, please interrupt me because it, I can go on forever, okay? Um, what's common between these problems? Uh, well, in every case, we are going to use multiple images as input. Um, and in every case, we are going to have a, a pretty good model of the image formation process. So nowadays in vision, a lot of people, they do um, uh, deep learning as a black box. So you get some input data, you, you, you go to the um, CNN or transformer store, and then uh, you, you know, and, and then you get some results. So in, in our case, we don't do that. We actually use a bit of deep learning, but you also use um, uh, um, physical models of what we are, we are, we are looking for. Also, I think for many, many years, when it was not so fashionable, I, I, I did object recognition. I'm not so interested in that anymore. I think it's, uh, nowadays, I think a lot, a lot of work is dedicated to, uh, you know, getting an extra point or two on some ben benchmarks. And I think it's time to look at real engineering and scientific applications because the, the problems are quite fascinating. Um, and then maybe you can have some impact, so. All right. So I start with, uh, with uh, image, image processing, image restoration. So it's a very old problem. People have been working on it since the 50s. Um, but I think it's still a very important problem today for, for many, many different applications. Of course, uh, smartphones, but also um, scientific applications such as mi microscopy and astronomy. And even, you know, you want to do it for, I don't know, autonomous cars and things like that. So I'm going to use, as a running example, I'm going to use uh, smartphones, but again, um, uh, scientific imaging is also a big application. So if you, if you think of smartphones, so my, my phone is pretty good. It takes excellent pictures. Um, all phones take excellent pictures. The, the, there's progress every day. Um, but, uh, but still, still there are some limitations. Um, there's huge progress because there, it's, a, it's a market with billions of customers. So people put a lot of effort into it. 
And, um, and it's not the first criterion when you buy a phone. It's not the first criterion, it's third or fourth, but it's the criterion that people, all the smartphone makers use for marketing. Um, so the, 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 the cameras and phones are very, very good, but if you zoom, if you keep on zooming, of course, eventually, um, eventually things will get blurry. Um, so if you take the, this picture and you zoom there, um, then eventually, you know, it's, it's blurry. The dynamic range is not very good. Let me try with this. The dynamic range is not very good. So if you have a picture like this, in the, in the very well lit parts, the, the sky is you know, white instead of being blue. In the dark parts, you don't see anything. And if you take pictures at night, um, the pictures are going to be noisy. Okay? And the, the solution uh, cannot be purely uh, a hardware solution because the, the sensors I mean, the phone is small, so the, the sensor and the optics and all that have to be small, and you cannot improve that for it. It's very different from the case of a DSLR, for example, right? a, big, a big lens and a big sensor. So the, the solution has to, to come from, from software. So why, why, why mix machine learning, computer vision, image restoration? Um, Part of it is that you have, um, you have normally a good, a good model of the uh, image formation process. For example, in, in typically, um, you have the, the image, the latent image you are looking for, X, and then you have the observed image, Y, and there are some operator A that you can think of, for example, as a blur operator or, or more complex operator and some noise. So you, this you know because you, you, you know, people build, build telephones. Um, you also have some prior knowledge you can exploit. So for example, in images, we know that you have cell similarities in images. We also know that images can be well represented by, uh, by sparse models, where sparsity means that you have some kind of local linear models with few, few of the atoms active. Um, also, because we have a very good image formation model, we can, we, we can create easily very good um, simulated examples for training, right? Which is not the case, for example, for recognition. And finally, as you, you will see, because what we are going to do is mix these physical models with a bit of learning, you are going to have a, a learning architecture, but learning architecture that you can interpret because it's functional architecture. You are solving an inverse problem and you're optimizing some stuff, you know what you are doing, so which, which I think is good. There's a price to pay is that uh, you almost never have access to real ground truth because your, your, your phone or your, your image sensor will not capture at the same time very high quality image and a degraded image. You'll capture only one of them. And you can, of course, you can take say, a smartphone picture and a DSLR picture and align them, but it's not real ground truth. So it's a real problem. And, and when I talk about astronomy, we'll have the same problem. Uh, we will not have ground truth either. So. All right, so I'm going to talk about super resolution. So some of you may have seen that paper a few years back from uh, Google. So you take these, I think, eight by eight, eight by eight images, and then boom, you get this, which is pretty impressive. Okay, so those are those are face images, and you reconstruct it's a times four resolution, uh, super resolution. So you get these very impressive results. But the um, there's a caveat is that those are not the people that, that were, those are not pictures of the people that were used to generate the, the, the input picture. So, so this on the right is the ground truth. That's where the, those are the pictures where they are decimated to create the, the data. In the middle, you reconstruct people, but I would argue that at least for the top picture, it's not the same person. And there has been further progress on that. And then there are some examples from different methods. So, on the left, I think those are, I don't know what to say, the picture 16 by 16, slightly higher. Then you have bicubic interpolation, which is not very good, of course. And then you have, you have methods similar, similar to the ones I just, I just mentioned. And then you get even better methods that do crazy things like times 64 super resolution. So it's 64 times 64 more pixels, but it's not the same person. The person is switching between the, the third and the fourth column, okay? It's not, there's nothing wrong with these methods. These methods are perfectly fine and actually quite impressive. But the problem is that in a single image, you don't have enough information to recover, to recover um, the, the, true, the true details, okay? And of course, the authors are quite aware of that. 
uh, and and in their whatever their their model card, they they, they actually explained that um, you know this is not to be taken as as a as a, as some kind of revealing the truth. It's more of a not experiment. Okay. But the, the, the point is, there's just not enough information. Actually, I can give you a, a very simple algorithm that give, will give you always a completely, um, completely realistic picture. So if you take the picture mm -hmm. on the left and try to guess which one of these three old guys uh, was decimated to, 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 to create it, um, I'll let you guess. But um, I, a simple, perfect algorithm for super resolution is I, I get a bag of photographs. And you give me the left picture, and I just pick one at random. And the picture that they will show you will be perfectly realistic, of course. So that, that's not the way to do it. So from a single image, you have to hallucinate the details. And in fact, this is a well-known fact. This is um, an old paper by Baker and Canadé from 2002. And it's called hallucination reconstruction, because uh, they were aware that you hallucinate the detail. In this case, they, they use the fact that you are looking at the face. And if you know you are looking at the face, you can get some very good reconstruction. But, uh, but I would argue that the, the, the way to do things is, is not by looking at a single image, is by uh, using multiple pictures. If you have multiple pictures, you have redundant information, you have the information that you need to do the actual reconstruction. So people have been working on that for quite a while. Um, one of the earliest papers in, in the computer vision community, at least by uh, Michele Reni and Shmuel Peleg in 1991, where they were taking multiple pictures and reconstructing the thing at the bottom. The, the quality is not great. It's, it's probably because the, the technology was not that great at the time. It's also because the reproduction of the picture is pretty bad. So I don't blame them. Uh, on the right, you have, a, you have a recent example from a Google Pixel, from the Ronsky and I in Peman uh, Minofar's group. And what they do, again, you use multiple pictures, and then you can because the, the quality of the, the camera is so good, you know, you have to take really small crops and blow them up, and then you see that you, you, get, you get quite good results. So this is, this is the path we are going to follow. So in the picture that I was showing to you, it's actually neither Jan nor Marcel nor me, it's this general, and this, in the, in the, mid, the middle is the reconstruction that we get. And it's not perfect, but I would argue that those are the right people. Those are synthetic pictures. Synthetic pictures are, not so interesting because real pictures are much, much tougher. So um, this is the, the idea of what we do. Uh, in single image super resolution, you take as input a, a single RGB image, and then you output a single high resolution image. In our case, we are going to take a burst of images. So your, your smartphone, when you press a button, will take, is, when, when you turn on the camera on your smartphone, it doesn't necessarily tell you, but it constantly requires burst of images. And, uh, and when you press the button to, when you click the button to take the picture, it will pick one or in general multiple pictures and fuse them to get, uh, to, to get what it delivers to you. Um, I don't know if you know about it either, but the um, uh, digital camera typically does not capture RGB signal at every pixel. It only captures R, G, or B. In front of the pixel grid, you have a, a filter, filter array, and typically it's a, a Bayer filter, so you have RGGB pattern. And then your camera interpolates that black and white picture to get you the, the, the full resolution RGB image. So in that, this process is called demosaicing, and it works pretty well, but you lose information in the mosaicing process because you're already doing interpolation. So we don't take as input an RGB picture. We take as input a burst between, say, 10 and 30 images of raw, raw data. And then we, we fuse them uh, to get our, our image. Um, and of course, having these, these, these raw pictures and having a burst helps you even for the mosaicing. Because when uh, something I forgot to mention is when, when I take a picture, I, I, me, me at least, I shake a little bit, but most people, they, they have some tremor. And, and so the, the pictures are, are, are a bit shifted from each other, which means that a single pixel in the high resolution image may gather data from actually the, the actual R, G, or B part of the sensor that the image in the, in the burst. 
So which means that you can re actually reconstruct. You don't need to have an interpolation algorithm. You can actually reconstruct the, the true color signal. And so on the right, this is, a, this is a, an, an RGB image capture after the mosaicing from a, a smartphone picture. And you can see probably that you have, uh, you have these yellow bands and that you have lost the, some of the detail of the underlying grid. With the kind of method that I'm going to describe, this is what you recover. The yellow bands are gone and you get the real detail. Okay, so, so it's pretty convenient. Uh, in computer vision, it's very, um, what people typically do is they show you tons of tables in numbers and they say they are the best and I think we are the best of course, but I'm not going to show you tables. I'm just going to show you quantitative results. You have to trust me about the tables. All right, so this is an example. So I, I don't know how to display our images. So on the left, those are, those are images in a burst of maybe 20 images. I put them in black and white because the, the, the raw images are black and white, but he was showing you the raw images, they would look different because of the RGGB pattern. And so <clears throat> image burst captured by, um, not by a smartphone, but by a good quality uh, prosumer camera, it's a Lumix GX9. And on the right, that's what, that's what we, we reconstruct. This is a small crop of this, a very small crop of this image. On the left, you have the input burst. As you can see, um, the the image is shifting during the burst acquisition, and also it's very noisy. It's noisy in part because we chose to uh, to do a short exposure uh, to minimize, for example, uh, motion blur. Uh, it's very noisy, and also you can't really read the, the text. On the right, you have the, the, the our reconstruction. Yeah, you can read the text easily. The, 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 the noise is gone, and you even have this little uh, grid pattern at the bottom it's not hallucinated, this read there on the, on, on the label of the, of, of the ROM bottle. So how does it work? Uh, it's, it's very simple. What we do is we, we, we have a good model of image formation. So how, how do you get the observed image from the latent high resolution image? Well, first you have a motion that you need to estimate, a warp you need to estimate. And in our case, we are going to to model it by a piecewise affine uh, model. So locally it's affine, but globally of course it's not. Then you have to resample it to get the, the, the grid of the high resolution image. Then of course you have to average the small pixel of the high resolution image into the big pixel of the big pixels of the high res of a low resolution image. So you have a blur operator, and then you have to sample that, that blurred image. So when you put all this together, you have the warp that you need to estimate, the blur, of course, you know, and the decimation operator, of course, you know, and then you add some noise. And the noise is important because we are going to use synthetic images for, <clears throat> for uh, training our system, so it's important to model the noise properly. So you have that, that model, then you take your, your, this, your corruption operator, UK, so K is the index of the, the image in the burst, and then you write the solution of finding the high resolution image from the low resolution one as the solution of an inverse problem. So it's a least squares problem that's going to be regularized by a regularizer phi theta, and that's your inverse problem, run of the mean inverse problem. And then uh, phi theta, we are going to learn. We are going to learn the regularizer, the new part that we are going to learn. How we are going to learn it? Well, we are going to do it in a, in a supervised manner. So we, we create, we take real pictures, high quality pictures. Then we create a realistic burst using a good noise model. Again, that's where the noise is important. And, um, and knowledge about the camera. And so we have, uh, we have synthetic uh, examples and we minimize in a supervised way the, 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 the difference. The, so this is our optimization problem once again. How do we solve it? Well, we use a very classical approach to it. It's a half quadratic, half quadratic split, splitting or quadratic penalty method. So what we do is we introduce um, an auxiliary variable z, such that the optimization respect to z is simple. And then we iterate. Uh, as, mu, as mu gets bigger and bigger at each iteration, z will come closer and closer to x, and so closer and closer to the actual solution. The, the, the problem in Z is simple. It's a, it's a linear least squares problem. That's why we introduced that variable. And so you can use it, you can solve that problem by many methods. But in, in our case, we use gradient descent. 
then we need to estimate the warp. This is a nonlinear uh, least square problem, so you can, you can solve it using Gus Newton iterations. And then the, the, the more difficult thing is the, the, the X estimate, because you need to solve this regularized um, prob least squares problem. And this is uh, it's called a proximal update because the operator on the right is a, is a proximal operator associated to the regularizer fee. So because we iterate, we don't need to run the gradient descent to the end. We don't need to run Gauss Newton to, to the end. It's very much in the spirit of stochastic gradient descent where you only take a few steps at a time you, because you don't want to optimize to death because you are going to... to to, uh, to iterate. And then for the proximal update, that's the difficult part. So what do we do? We use a plug and play approach. So we just, we don't know how to solve it, so yeah, replace it by CMN. And you know. And so that's it. It's very simple. So some examples. So this is a close-up of the same image I was showing to you. The, the, that's the, the, the JPEG image. And the the, the bad quality is not due to the JPEG compression. It's due to the fact that it's slow resolution and noisy because short exposure. And this is what we get. Again, noise is gone. You get a lot of detail. This is another close-up of the same picture. This is the, the, a doll. And this is what we get. What's interesting is that we do recover the hair. The hair is not hallucinated, it's the real hair. We, re we recover the, the details in there, it's not hallucinated. It's not perfect. If you look at the edge here, there's a slight red fringe. It's because the, 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 the camera in your phone is designed for its own resolution, not for super resolution. So there is chromatic aberration in the sensor. And of course, when you blow up the thing, the chromatic aberration will show up. So it's not perfect, but it's pretty good. It's another example. So Julien took that. So this was from uh, Lumix. This, I think, is again from Lumix. Julien was in Spain on vacation or something. He took the picture on the left. And this is, uh, this is a, a crop of the little red square. And if you, I don't know if, it, yeah, I think it shows. Um, so it's, it's, it's fuzzy, but also you have kind of like purple dots. You have these bizarre color, color patterns. This is what we get. So it's not bad. All right. So what we did next is, you know, th so th the resolution of cameras is limited, but also their dynamic range is limited. So can you improve it? So if you want to take night pictures, and yes, you can. I mean, if there is an example, so there are real pictures of uh, Notre Dame. All, all the examples I'm showing you are real pictures. Uh, real picture of Notre Dame on the left, the input, on the right, what we get, and, and some close up. And as you can see, we can, you can read the text, and then you can get details in the dark and the light place. So in, in, in night pictures, what will happen typically is that the dark places, you don't see anything. The bright places are saturated, so the color or signal is meaningless. Okay? So what, what we can do is take a burst, but vary the exposure time during the burst. So we'll underexpose and superexpose some of the image in the burst. And then it's pretty much the same method as before, except that we, uh, we weigh the pictures with the weight, including a predictor. I'm not going to go into details. And this is another example. And on the right, you have the uh, part of the burst. So at um, short exposure, very noisy, and, and high exposure, completely saturated. And th this is what we reconstruct. Okay. Here's another example. Those are the pictures in the burst that uh, Bruno, my co-author, took in his, in his apartment. So it's uh, facing a, a spotlight. And some of the, in the pictures that are underexposed, you don't see anything. In the pictures that are exposed, you only see the spot. And on the right, here are the close-ups of the middle pictures of some spot in the images. So it's the neighbor's window. Uh, Bruno's uh, smartphone, and I don't know what is at the bottom. Oh, yeah, it's in the, it's the, the blue square there. Okay. And the middle picture is the one that supposedly is the, the best exposed of the bunch, and this is what you get. We recover details everywhere. You can even see the, um, you can even see the bulb in the spot. It's not perfect. There's a slight uh, purple halo around, the, around the, the spot, but it's not bad. And you can see that 
that Bruno has a disgusting trackpad covered with dust and crap and stuff, but you can actually read what he's writing, right? So it's not bad. So when when you do these kind of things, if you if you really want people to use this kind of technology, it has to be robust. So the underlying model in this is that you are looking at a rigid scene. But in reality, when you take pictures of people, you take a burst, people, yeah, they will move. You know, they will, hey, they're waving. Or in this case, this is um, a close-up of, um, it's a crop of a, <clears throat> a street scene, and the guy on the upper left is, is running. So this, is, this goes against your model. So what we have here, <clears throat> sorry, are examples of, of reconstruction from two of the, the, the top, um, top methods for super resolution from the people at ETH and the people at MegV, which is a big uh, Chinese uh, deep learning company. And they give extremely good results, but you can see that because of the, the picture do not obey the model, you get these artifacts um, at, the, at the bottom and at the top here. Um, on the right is, okay, this is what, what we get, and, uh, and this is very important because if you have a user, if you get artifacts like that, the user will not use your software, right? So we have actually uh, cre we created a, a startup to, uh, to to sell that stuff. We'll see if it works, and we are doing that for photography, but also for scientific imaging, uh, for example, looking at skin and things like that. So we'll see we'll see how it goes. How to go, how to go further? So one of the things we, you, we want to do is um, is deep blur sharp images. So this is a small crop of the the, the big image on the, on the top right. So it's obtained by a Canon 5D. So it's a professional DSLR with a very good lens, and it's a it's a sharp picture, it's very high quality. But um, again. Uh, Lenses are not perfect, so if you look at the bottom right, you can see this red fringe, it's chromatic aberration. And because you, are, you zoom, 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 uh, of course it's a little bit blurry. But nowadays you can, you can uh, estimate the PSF, the point spread function of, uh, of a lens, and then you can invert it. And so you get more detail, and you also get rid of the chromatic aberration. So we want to do, this is just preliminary test of that. We want to do it uh, more. And it's challenging because um, how do you get the, the training data? Because you, you, don't, you don't have access to the pictures without the PSF blur. So, and self-supervised methods are, are, are challenging because the, with the kind of method that we are using, if you use a self-supervised method, it will, it will force the, 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 the regularizer to be zero to fit the data, so it is challenging, but we are working on it. The other thing we want to do is to, we want to fully model the, the optics, and then not only change the exposure time, but change the focus. And if you fully model the optics, and you model the motion of, the, of your phone as you, as, as you, you take the burst, um, then you can recover the 3D structure, we can recover the focus information, and then you get infinite art, you get improved depth of field, which is, again, important for scientific imaging. So we have not done the, the, the change of focus yet, but we have started on the recovering the 3D, the 3D data. And this is challenging because, um, you know, of course, structure for motion and all that works very well, but you have a very small baseline. You are, you are just hand tremor, so a few millimeter displacement. Um, so, you know, it's not perfect, but it's getting there. We get the, this is from the real burst of images, and we get the free structure. All right. So that's all I wanted to tell you about, about photography, and now let's switch gear and, and, and look at astronomy. Um, so you, you probably all know that um, So this is the solar system, so Pluto is not there anymore because it's not considered a planet anymore. Um, so we have eight planets in the, in the solar system, but we want to know if there are planets around the other stars. Why? Uh, in part because uh, we would like to know if there's life in the universe outside of, of uh, Earth. Okay? And so, so people have been looking for, for exoplanets for I don't know, 20 years, something like that. And they have, they have found a bunch of them. We are mostly interested in finding Earth-like planets, um, but it's difficult. How do people do it? 
So most of you probably know the method on the right. So planets in a solar system are laying a plane, it's called the ecliptic plane. And if you, if, if you observe a star and, and you yourself are pretty much in the ecliptic plane, when, when the planet rotates around the star, at some point it will pass in front of the star, and of course the star will dim. The, the, the star will dim. And so you can look at the star and see you know, how bright it is, and if it dims, you can, you can infer there's an exoplanet. So that, that's the simplest one to explain. Actually, the, the oldest method is not that one. The radial velocity method, and I really like it. So the way it works is that when you have a planet rotating around the star, the star actually rotates around the planet a bit as well. So it, not much, but it moves a little bit. So it moves a little bit. The, if, again, if you're in the plane of the ecliptic, the, 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 there will be an, an induced velocity toward you. And as, as it, come, it comes around in front of the star, the velocity will increase. It goes back behind. The velocity will decrease. And that will induce a Doppler shift in the spectrum of the star. And so if you see that the, the, the spectrum of the star is shifting like this, uh, then you can infer that there, there, there's a planet around the star. So those two methods are, are great, but they don't tell you anything about the atmosphere of the planets. And if you are looking for life, well, you may want to look for you know, uh, water, vapor, whatever in the atmosphere. Okay? But these don't tell you, they're indirect. So there's an, another more challenging uh, way of finding exoplanets is you... You take a big telescope, it has to be big, because you need very high resolution. Take a big telescope, and such as the VLC, for example, and, um, and then you, you put a coronagraph. A coronagraph is a black dot that you put in the pupil of your telescope in front of the star, and it creates an artificial e eclipse. And then you look in the halo of the star for the planet. So this is... This, this is, um, those are real images, but from a very um, easy case, where the planets are very bright. Normally, the planets are going to be very dim, and so it's very challenging to find the planet. This is kind of data. Again, the idea of the chronograph, this is what you have your star is very bright, you hide it, and then in a halo, you will have a very dim, a very dim planet. So for this, you need big telescopes. So in space, you can put telescopes, but they cannot be very big because you need a very big rocket to send them up there. Okay? On Earth, you can build a very, very big telescope. But the problem with Earth is that we have a, well, I think it's a good thing, but we have an atmosphere. And the atmosphere screws up the, the light coming in. Okay? It deforms the wave front. Because it deforms the wave front, what I always say, I'm not sure it's true, but what I've read is that <coughs> normally the the spatial resolution of the telescope is proportional to the width, to the diameter of the, of the mirror. But because of the atmosphere, the resolution that you get is limited to about um, 30 centimeters, 12 inches. If you get bigger telescope, you get more light, so you can get faint objects, but you don't get um, more resolution. Well, this was the case until the, the 90s, but then people created what's called adaptive optics, so you, you get your telescope, you, you deflect some of uh, the light towards, um, towards some wavefront sensor that's going to measure how screwed up the sensor is, the, the wavefront is, and then you have little actuators behind the mirror, and they are going to deform. The, the mirror is like a membrane, and you deform in real time the, the mirror so as to, um, to, uh, to diminish the, the, the effect of the atmosphere. So those are, those are actual examples. There are pictures of Neptune. Without the adaptive optics from Earth, you don't see anything. With the Hubble telescope, you don't have the, the, the atmosphere, so it's pretty good. But the Hubble telescope is, I don't know how big it is, but it's a couple of meters diameter. But now we have, we have very big um, telescopes on Earth, and with the adaptive optics, we get better resolution. There's one more trick, physical trick, to, to, to make things simple. When you, if you look at the sky at night and you wait, the sky will appear to rotate around the, the, the North Star. It's because of rotation of the Earth. Okay? So what you can do is you can take... So this is, of course, a toy example. This is, it would be a sun and a planet. So you can take multiple pictures. And as you take multiple pictures, the star and the planet will appear to rotate. 
And you, but of course, you know everything about your telescope, so you can undo the rotation and align the pictures. And while you do that, you will, because you have rotated picture, the, the halo will decorrelate. And so you can remove the halo in a sense, or at least you can enhance the, 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 the appearance of the pictures in the halo. And that will help a lot. So I don't know if you know about this. So th there's, um, there's a, a telescope in Chile in the Acatama Akat Desert, I think it's called, up 6,000 meters high. Um, that is that's pretty big, it's 50 square meters, so it's uh, like seven meter uh, diameter telescope. And this has been active since 1999, and that's the data we are using in our experiments. But they are building a big, big telescope. So the extremely large telescope will, will get first light normally in 2027. It might be delayed, but this guy is like 30 meter, more than 30 meter diameter. That, that, that's really big, okay? And so with this thing, you can get a lot of detail. And people are going to build bigger and bigger telescopes because we have very good, and they have what's called extreme adaptive optics. You can get um, you can get really good images with this. So what do we do? So the kind of data that we get is this. So this is one picture in a, in a, in a, in a sequence, in false color. In the, the star is in the middle, hidden by the, by the coronascope. And then, um, and then you have the halo here. And near the, near the star, it's a mess. You don't see much. But even farther from the star, it's a mess as well. There are some planets. There's one up there and one down there. Uh, uh, you can see it or not see it. Or maybe it's not one down there. There's one uh, at the bottom with the red circles. And <clears throat> it's difficult because the, um, the halo is called, it's typically, it's usually called the speckles. Um, they look like they look like plan the, the planets, and the planet you know what they look like is point source that that's blurred by the PSF of the telescope. The PSF of the telescope we know because we, we measure it by looking at for a background star or by shining a laser in, in the sky, and and the, the halo looks a lot like like exoplanets, and the exoplanets are very dim because some of them radiate their own energy and they may be hot but mostly it's reflected energy from the star and the halo is very bright. The halo is, um, so on the right I'm showing two slices, the, 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 the black slices and dotted slice. And if you look at the sequence of images, what you will see is that the halo is specially um, uh, non-stationary, non, non of course. It changes a lot with the position, but temporarily it's quasi, Stationary, so you can average average out quite a bit of the of the halo. We have a good image formation model. The the speckles, well, we don't have a good model for them, but they are there. And then for the stars, it's just point sources um, blurred by the um, by the, the PSF of the telescope plus a rotation of operator, and the contrast will be how bright the the, the star is, and of course there's noise. And so we, 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 we just got a paper accepted to the monthly notice of the Astronomical Society with, uh, with uh, astronomer colleagues of ours and uh, Olivier Flasser with the lead, lead daughter on this. And uh, we have this very simple method. First, we uh, whitened the data uh, using a simple uh, local statistical model of, of, the, of the speckle. Then we align the sources and they rotate the, 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 the input data, and then we use some, you know, some units. Okay, very simple. Um, well, that that doesn't matter very much. This is like for for what, what is important is it's like for um, the photography work. We don't have the ground truth. So what, what people do is that they, they make synthetic pictures. It's easy to make synthetic pictures because you know you have a very good model of the you know the PSF of the telescope. Okay? But we don't have gone through, which makes testing very hard. And training hard as well, because your data might be polluted by false negatives. There are planets out there. And you don't know they are there. Okay? So it, it makes it quite challenging. So this works quite well. So the way you typically um, evaluate this thing, you evaluate it in synthetic data as well. Those are called contrast curves. Um, 
and, and the, the, the game is to, to have the lowest curve possible. So in green, that's the method that I described to you, and the other colors are competing methods. And you can see it's quite a bit better. And also, you can actually estimate the, the best possible uh, response you could get uh, from physical, physical models. So it works pretty good. And we, we haven't found exoplanets yet. We have found one new source. Um, given the distance to the star, it's probably an exoplanet. Probably not an exoplanet. It's probably a background star, a uh, brown dwarf. But still, and so we are, we are going to do the, the, um, the bigger experiments and, and more data to try to find real exoplanets. You can also try to estimate the flux. That's important because that's the energy radiated by the star. It's important because this is how you will, you will um, look for, for um, biomarkers. And again, the, in this game, you have to be as low as possible, and, and we do pretty well. You can improve the results by looking using multispectral data. Your telescope is going to measure uh, images in multiple wavelengths and to improve the results a bit. Um, and what we are working on now is um, to do it the right way. What we did was very basic. We, we, we have a very simple physical model, then we do deep learning. Instead, what we would like to do is have a model of what's happening. We want to do essentially source separation. We want to model the speckle and we want to model the, 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 the planet. The planet is so easy, but the speckle is difficult. So we are looking at a diffusion model to, to, to look for speckle. So generative AI, it's, 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 it's a kind of bizarre way to, 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 to call, call things because it's about synthesizing things. But in, in classical machine learning, generative means modeling uh, probability distribution. And what diffusion models are really about is that. So I'm a bit skeptical, say, that but modeling the probability distribution of faces for, say, 10,000 examples of faces. But for the speckle, it looks a lot like texture. And I think I'm much more optimistic. So we are working on, on, on using that to, 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 to find planets. And next, what do we do? I'm running late, but I'm almost done. Um, next, what we are going to do is look at extended objects. So Outside of the solar system, everything is a, almost everything, I will show you an example in a minute, is a point source. You know, a star will look like a blob, but it's because of the optics. A star is a point source, so is a planet. Except that there are extended structures around, around stars, so in particular around young stars, you are going to have what's called a circumstellar disk. It's a disk of debris and dust around the star. And this you can resolve. So those are examples from existing methods in, um, in single wavelength and in multi, multiple wavelength. And what we want to do is improve this to get the real structure that you get around the star. So that's what we are going to start working on now. Eventually, I would like to do super resolution on planet pictures. So this is a beautiful picture, I think, of Neptune and its rings. I don't know if you know that there are rings around Neptune taken by the James Webb telescope. But, but as you take pictures, the planet rotates. And so you get multiple pictures, like in a burst. So you could do super resolution a priori. Okay, so people have, have not managed to do super resolution on, on, uh, on planets, as far as I know yet. But that would be cool. Plus, I think it's a beautiful picture. On the bottom left is a thing I find amazing. This is Betelgeuse. And I don't know if you knew, but people were afraid it would blow up. It's a red giant that's not very far from the Earth. And it dimmed for a while. And people thought it would explode because it's that dimming. So it, it, they found out that, in fact, it, the, the dimming was not because it was exploding. It was, uh, it was, there was a big solar flare. It ejected material. When the material was attracted back to the surface, there was dust, and it dimmed the surface. But the amazing thing is those are pictures of Betelgeuse. They are resolved. This thing are like five pixels across. This thing is big enough, close enough, you can resolve it. Imagine that we do super resolution on that and you get details. That would be pretty cool. And on the top right, there's something we haven't done yet, but I want to do. I have a colleague at SU Passer, I know I'm running late, that, that is doing molecular microscopy. These dots there, they are individual molecules. So you shine a laser on a, on a specimen, on a biology specimen. Those are, I think, synapses. And, um, and, and what, what happens is that as you shine the lasers, individual molecules will fluoresce. And then you shine the laser multiple times, and different molecules fluoresce. And then you can 
have, have pictures of molecules. And again, you want to do super resolution in that. Um, I'm going to stop here probably, I'm, I'm late. Uh, if you have questions, I'm going to run the, the video of um, prediction. I'm happy to answer the question. Thank you very much, Professor, for sharing your insights. Um, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, we are, since we are running out of our time, thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so I'm afraid we will not be able to receive questions uh, from the floor, but if you have any, um, I think you will be able to ask questions to him after the event, so please. Um, and so that brings us to the end of the third keynote speech. Once again, thank you very much for your valuable presentation, Professor. Once again, please give him a big hand. So now we will wrap up there. And I have a one housekeeping announcement. We will take a break and resume with the fourth keynote speech at 2 p.m. So we'll see you in a bit. Thank you very much. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the afternoon session of the Korea AI Summit 2023. I hope you all enjoyed your lunch and I'm glad to be back as well. The Korea AI Summit 2023 is being broadcast on our YouTube channel. And uh, today we have a very special guest joining us online. Uh, we will now move on to our fourth keynote speech and the fourth keynote speaker will be Professor Max Welling. He'll be talking about the AI in science and the science in AI. Professor, are you ready? Yes, thank you very much. Can I start? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome me with a big hand. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to just start talking. Um, if anything goes wrong with uh, the, tech the techniques and the technology, please uh, reach out. I hope everybody can hear me well. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, this kind of interesting topic on how to look for a new way to looking at neural representations. Um, and the title is Fluids, Brains and Representations. Um, so the topics are, I'm first going to introduce a few things um, and then uh, talk about AI for science. And then I'll switch in part two to how science can aid AI. And then finally, I will conclude. Um, so uh, it's of course been quite obvious that um, deep learning and um, sort of generative AI have had a big impact and has had lots of successes um, and we are seeing in a, in an accelerated way that um, AI is making a big impact uh, one of the most important advances certainly in the sciences is AlphaFold where um, Google DeepMind managed to predict the three-dimensional structure of a protein um, from its amino acid sequence, which is hugely important in biology. Um, but also, of course, ChatGPT, um, where you can prompt a system with a, with a sentence and you will get a, sort of a intelligent response out. Um, here's an example where it is asked to write a proof that there are infinitely many primes, but in rhyme. Um, and of course, you can also generate things like uh, images, uh, paintings, um, and short videos. And of course, soon uh, we'll see much longer um, and interesting videos uh, also being generated by um, generative AI. What I'm particularly excited about is the application of these ideas uh, to the natural sciences. So I already mentioned uh, protein folding as a very important example of this. Our, we have ourselves worked on um, Let's see if I can get a laser pointer here on the screen. Yeah, we ourselves have uh, worked on um, generative models for molecules. So there you would prompt it with, let's say, a certain property that you would like to see in the molecule. And then you would generate examples of these molecules 
um, you know, with those approximate properties. Um, and the innovation was that we made this model completely equivariant, which means that it would generate the molecule with exactly the same probability in any orientation or location. And a third example is plasma control, um, where uh, this is a reinforcement learning algorithm where um, you would observe a plasma in a fusion reactor and have and could control over magnetic fields to make sure that the plasma doesn't touch the actual boundary of the uh, tokamak fusion reactor so that it will stay contained. Um, I'll, I'll first do a little bit of an introduction now, so, in, so some introductory words on some technology that we need further in the talk. Um, so the first um, sort of technical model that I need to introduce is the variational autoencoder. Um, this is work um, that uh, Diederik Kingma did in my lab um, already quite a few years ago now, maybe almost 10 years ago. Um, and if you wish to read more about it, there is this, uh, this uh, book called An Introduction to Variational Autoencoders uh, that we wrote um, that you can pick up. Um, and the idea here is this is also a generative model. So we have a generative lag here where you, gener where you first sample a random number, z, from a prior distribution, p of z, um, from a simple distribution, perhaps a Gaussian distribution, and then you have a conditional distribution, px given z, which could also be a neural network, um, or it could be even a simulator, and this will be important later, so this could be a simulator, maybe with also random parts in it, um, and that would then generate a point from a much more complicated distribution, uh, the marginal distribution over the data. And for instance, this could be uh, images of echocardiograms of a heart. Now, on the other side, there's the encoder model. The encoder model is supposed to be an approximation to the inverse of the decoder model, where it's more like a neural network where you pick an input data point, which could be an echocardiogram sampled from the marginal distribution or an approximation of the marginal distribution. Um, and then map it through the encoder model, which could again be a neural network, uh, to a point uh, on some marginal distribution over z, which would be an approximation of p of z. Um, and um, so you can think of this in an EM fashion. So if the in expectation maximization fashion, you would need this inference in order to train the decoder model. But reversely, you can think of being actually interested in this model, maybe to predict properties of the input. And you can then think of the decoder model as a prior for the encoder model to, um, to put your physical intuition, like in a simulator, into the, into the model. Um, the other thing that we need is, again, some form of inductive bias, which in this case is the idea of equivariance. Um, and if you want to read about that, of, this is a wonderful book, a recent book written by Maurice Weiler, PhD student who's about to graduate. It's a 500-page book, beautifully illustrated with pictures like this one and this one you see on the cover. Um, the first steps in this um, theory were taken by uh, Taco Cohen in my lab, um, 2016 around that, um, where we defined the notion of equivariance, which is the idea to, of embedding um, knowledge about symmetry groups of the world, of the input, um, into your neural network. And in this case, um, so you, let's say that you have a neural network that maps an image to a filtered version of that image, and we can call that map um, F. Um, and then we have two uh, sort of transformations. Phi X is a uh, symmetry transformation in the space, in the original space, it could be Phi of X, that maps this gecko, let's say, to a translated gecko or to a rotated gecko. Um, and, um, and what we now want is that if we first translate the image and then filter it in the neural network sense, uh, that should be the same as first filtering it and then translating it. So this in mathematics you call the compute, commuting diagram. Um, and if you make sure that this property holds, then you can also be sure that if you change something at the input, you have the proper transformations at the output of the neural network. Um, Okay, so that's the introductory part. 
Um, now I'll talk a little bit about um, sort of how um, AI can help the sciences, or how yeah how AI can help the sciences. And uh, for that, I want to talk a little bit about um, some work and some ideas um, from uh, my time at Microsoft Research. And the idea is that um, let's think about how are we discovering new things in science. Um, so let's say we're trying to build an airplane. In the early days, you would build an airplane on your intuitions, and then you would fly it and try it. And if it come crashing down, something was wrong. And if you survived it, you tried again. Now, a more modern version is, um, instead of trying to fly it, uh, you would put it in a wind tunnel. And then you would do lots of measurements um, in the wind tunnel, and that's in a, going in a database. And from that, you would maybe apply machine learning in order to develop the next generation. So in terms of uh, modern ways that airplanes are designed, more and more of that process goes into a computer. So even the wind tunnel part is going to be simulated in a computer because the aerodynamics uh, simulated by Navier-Stokes can all be done in, in silico. But of course, if you go to the right, you'll need more and more compute power. Something similar has happened for chemistry. If you want to design a new chemist, uh, compound, um, chemical compound, uh, you can just try a lot of things uh, on, on intuition and see what sticks. Or you can build theory and do lots of experiments in the lab and from that lab collect large databases and do perhaps machine learning on that and um, build, you know, and, and go through that cycle. Or you can do absolutely everything in your computer, including um, sort of the, the experiments, which now become computer experiments, which now become sort of simulations, which you will do in your computer. You have to do, you have to simulate every molecule, every molecule and, and all the electrons and the electrons follow quantum mechanics. And so it's very, very expensive um, as this blue curve shows here, but it's doable in principle on small scale. Now, what's the idea? The idea is now for the fifth paradigm is to say, instead of doing even these computer experiments again and again, we're going to store the data that we got from those experiments, in, in, even if they're done completely in silico. So let's go to an example. So I build a new car, a Mercedes, and then um, an old version of that. And I'm doing some, some uh, wind tunnel experiments. Um, and, um, and I'm gonna measure the properties of you know, how good it is. And then instead of, if I build a new car doing it again, um, what I can do is I can take this data and put it in a large database and then train a neural network on it. And the neural network can um, be a sort of um, a replacement of the actual expensive simulation in your computer by a neural network simulation. And this can go you know, many thousands times faster actually than the original simulation, so you would cut down a lot on the on the compute time. And um, so when you, your new car goes in, you basically test it on the, on the surrogate, which is the neural network. Now that idea has been tested on weather, for instance, and the weather models uh, trained on machine learning can predict the weather about equally good as the numerical simulators, um, but 10,000 times faster. So what we see is, um, interesting applications so we want to want to take these ideas and apply them to the sciences um, and the sciences are wonderful because um, they span a huge uh, spectrum of spatial temporal scales all the way from picometers and femtoseconds to galaxies right where we talk about light years and everything in between and the beauty actually is that all of these or, or many of these phenomena at all these scales are described by the same language, which is the language of partial differential equations, stochastic differential equations, and ordinary differential equations. Um, and um, this, let's go through a few examples of you know, how um, AI and machine learning can help these, these uh, simulations. So for instance, in quantum chemistry, there is a, th a theory or a method called density functional theory. And what it does basically, it solves for you the Schrodinger equation approximately. 
So here's a beautiful simulation from Quantum Magazine where um, these green blobs uh, show the location of the electrons um, as it sort of evolves around the atoms in a molecule. Um, but in principle, we are, we are trying to look at the actual time-independent Schrodinger equation, and we're trying to find the lowest energy state E of that molecule. Now, what you can do is it, it, that, that depends on an actual... So this is a partial differential equation, clearly. Now, that depends um, on a... This DFT depends on a functional called the free energy functional that uh, you don't really know, so you have to approximate it, and people use their physical intuition to build these. But these you can now train from machine learning data. So at the next level, you can do molecular dynamics, where you have lots of atoms and um, in, in lots of molecules. And uh, this is governed by what's called the Langevin equation. It's a second order STE. Um, and it basically simulates all the, all the, all the, all the, all the atoms through space. Um, and instead of, um, so, so here's a term that looks innocuous, which is dx, du dx, which is the force that you need in order to move the, um, the atom. But you really need to solve the Schrodinger equation, this one here, uh, in order to compute properly this, this force. And so what people have done is they have introduced force fields, and then they've trained these force fields using machine learning methods, basically graph neural networks. And then at a higher level still, uh, predicting the weather, um, there uh, you would need hydrodynamics. Um, and here, that is you, the, it's again a PDE that governs it. It's this Navier-Stokes equation. And here people have built uh, very successful surrogate solvers, basically based on neural networks, that can solve these models at a global scale um, 10,000 times faster. And there's beautiful applications in this field uh, for those students who are still looking for, for um, where to spend their time. Um, these generative models can help with uh, generating molecules. For instance, you can generate a molecule that should be some kind of drug to fit in the pocket of a protein, let's say. This is what you can see here in this particular simulation. You can use it to design new materials. For instance, if you wish to find a material that captures carbon out of the air using direct air capture, um, you can optimally design, maybe this is an MOF molecule, you can optimally design this uh, using these methods. And in catalysis, um, where you try to have a, some kind of surface that um, accelerates the chemical reactions that you're interested in. For instance, uh, you may want to accelerate uh, um, hydrogen production. Um, now, as you all probably know, um, there is a new area here, um, a new technology, which is this um, denoising, denoising diffusion-based models, um, which are built on either, you could call it a mathematical or a physical analog. Um, the, the, the mathematical formulation is the drift diffusion equation, which you can see here, uh, applied to an entire image, not to a molecule, but to an image. So here every pixel is a dimension of X, um, and you have a drift term, and you have a noise term, uh, Wiener noise. Um, and if you apply this iteratively um, in discrete time, you basically noise up an, an image um, into a bunch of noise pixels. And basically the idea is to invert this process. Uh, you can write down what the inverse stochastic process looks like. You pick up this extra score function here in the backward process, uh, and then you sort of learn to undo this noise process. And now you pick a random point in this noise, and then you generate some image from it that's living on this manifold. This is very similar. Actually, you can formulate this as a variational autoencoder with many stochastic steps in the middle. Um, and so this is very similar to what I said about variational autoencoders. Now, um, what I like about this is actually this is the same equation that you use, for instance, to model liquids. So this is a, a, a nice um, video from a tweet by uh, Peter Battaglia. Um, they use a different technique there, graph neural networks, to simulate uh, the process of, of a liquid. But in principle, um, this or the Langevin equation, which I showed, is the underlying equation for the molecules um, to, um, to, to um, that govern these molecules uh, in liquids. And that's what we will actually be using um, in the following 
um, at the more at more at the end of the presentation this this, this equations or this analogy we're trying to use also directly in machine learning so this was our first sort of um, an sort of effort in this field of, of molecular science. This is by this uh, fantastic team, uh, Emil Hogeboom, Victor Garcia Satoris, uh, and Clement Vignac. What we did here was um, we um, used a generative model like this diffusion-based generative model, exactly the technique that people used for these um, images to, to, you could say there's a noising process where you take a molecule and you noise it up to a bunch of to a blob of atoms of of different uh, type, and then you try to undo that by denoising it in this particular direction, um, and then you can out of sort of a random blob you can you can generate viable thermodynamically stable molecules, and of course you can try to guide that process towards useful drugs. Um, this model was equivariant in the sense that I discussed. So if you take your blob um, and you rotate it and then generate um, you know, a molecule, it should be the same as first generating and then rotating. And by the same, I mean is that the probability of this generation and this generation should be completely equal. So it, 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 it's not more probable to generate something that's a rotated version or a translated version of the other molecule. And here you see a beautiful uh, visualization uh, made by Emil and Victor, uh, where you see this process of denoising de in uh, in action and the molecule is being generated from noise again i would stress that this is actually built that this technique is actually built out of what's called non-equilibrium statistical mechanics um, it's a direct application of that of stochastic processes um, and that's why i also think that um, this field of non-equilibrium statistical mechanics can have a big impact on machine learning Here's another application of, of uh, diffusion models um, by these two students, Arne Schnoying and Ilya Ikajov, uh, together with uh, Bruno Carreira and Michael Bronstein um, in their labs. And um, so here the idea is that uh, we're going to do conditional generation. We have a pocket of, a, let's say, a protein with your, these green atoms here. Um, and then we're trying to generate a molecule, which are these atoms here, uh, that fits snugly into this pocket. And again, it's a similar technique, but now we have to condition. You can think of this as the prompt in a, in a sort of language model. You want to condition on this pocket that stays the same, and you'll generate the molecule that goes in there. So here's a little video of how that happens and the different um, sort of molecules that we can generate. In fact, we've sort of generalized this to have certain fragments. Those are fixed. So if you say, I, I want some part of my molecule to be like this. I know this fits very well in this particular part of the pocket. You keep these fragments fixed, and then you sort of complete the molecule um, so that it will um, sort of be a, a, a reasonable molecule um, that have those parts and that fits into the pocket. Um, another application of these ideas and this application um, to the sciences is in what we call transition path sampling. Um, so in transition path sampling, this is a problem in uh, chemistry, where um, so this this you can think of the surface as an energy surface. Every point is the conformation of a particular molecule, and if the if the conformation of a molecule changes, it sort of changes from one metal stable state, perhaps to another metal stable state. But in order to get there, it will have to go over an energy barrier, which is what you see here. Now, people are interested in studying, let's say, these, these, these paths as they go from one state to the other. Perhaps there could even be a chemical reaction happening here at the top um, because, they, uh, because they are representing chemical reactions. Now, if you wait very, very long and do your simulation in your computer, it will take the age of the universe to see these transition paths. So it's a very, very rare event. And so what we want to do is we want to accelerate this process in your computer so that we see more of them, and then of course compensate for the fact that we have accelerated if we want to compute things like um, reaction rates. And again, we have Langevin equation here, so the second order Langevin equation, um, but the difference with normal Langevin equation is this force term here. So this is a control term in terms of um, a control theory, an extra force which we apply to every atom, in order to move it over this energy barrier. Um, 
And uh, so now the, we have basically mapped the problem now to a control problem. We're going to say um, the reward is that in, after a finite amount of time, this molecule is in this new metastable state. And we want to do this by, a, by a for additional external force. But we want to apply as little of this force as possible because we can imagine it, it will cost us to actually apply of this, this force. And if we do that, then it will beautifully take these sort of the saddle points here in the um, energy potential energy surface. And if you apply this, um, so here's the free energy surface of a problem, and if you apply this to a molecule, you can just see beautifully how that molecule in our simulation moves from one state to another state. So here you can see the molecule actually being driven from one conformation to another conformation over this energy surface here. Um, and this is indeed the path that chemists observe in this particular very simple example. Though um, there's other problems that we applied it to. In fact, we've already improved this, um, this method already a little bit, um, but you can apply this also to bigger molecules. And finally, let's say to this, um, and in the, in the limit, this becomes basically a protein folding problem, right? So if you have a very large molecule and you start it in any state um, and you let it, you will you let it go. This actually this thing folds up, and you can study that process as well. Okay, that's part one. Um, now, um, in the second part of my talk, I will sort of be discussing the the reverse of what I just discussed. I was first discussing about how AI can help the sciences. I will now discuss um, how this how ideas from the sciences can help in machine learning. Um, very similar to the idea, of course. I think that the most important example of that is uh, this diffusion-based models, where a principle from the from physics and mathematics, this is Brownian motion, um, is, is used in order to be more successful in generating images and text. And this is worked together with um, uh, one student, Andy Thomas Keller in my lab, and, and Yue Song um, in our lab, collaborator. So, um, so, the thing I want to first discuss is so, um, how can we generalize equivariance? And one of the important reasons that we want to generalize it is that sometimes these symmetries are not following, let's say, nice group transformations, right? A rotation and a translation certainly is, we, we know the representation theory uh, for those groups and it's all very clean and then we can build them um, into the neural networks. Um, but oftentimes um, we might know the symmetry, but it might not actually be a group. It might be a semi-group, or it might not even be a group in any sense. It might just be a bunch of transformations. And there are sometimes even cases where we don't even know the, the transformations that we're looking for, but we know there are symmetry transformations in the data. And so what we're going to do is we're going to think of this again as a commuting diagram. Um, um, but now it's sort of in a generalized sense. So we have input data, let's say, you know, molecules or whatever, and we have symmetry transformations in the world. So these, or this could be images that we are rotating or molecules that we are translating or something like that. We have our encoder model, like in the variational autoencoder that maps the input data to hidden activations, an abstract representation of the data. Um, and we have a decoder um, that maps it back. Right, so given some transformation, we're going to um, transform back to transform data. And what we what we're missing is this link here. This is this would typically be given by these irreducible representations um, of the group representation. Um, but now we want to transform this. We're going to think about can we generalize this idea um, so that um, this would sort of become a representation of the underlying transformation of the world variables, but now in the hidden space. What would that transformation look like? Um, and it should mimic this particular transformation because we want this diagram to close. We transform the world, it should be the same as encoding, transform the hidden activations, and then mapping back to the world states. Again, it's a computing diagram, and so in that sense, you can think of this as a generalization of equivariance. And when we were doing this, um, we, we were starting to talk to neuroscientists, which is always a good idea because, you know, they study the brain and this is supposed to be at least some kind of analogy to the brain. 
Um, and we found that there are uh, groups that have seen um, things like waves in the cortex. So they see that um, if you excite the brain in a certain way through input, then certain wave mechanics happens in your brain, which is also something that we were contemplating. We were thinking about modeling these hidden representations over time, basically as some kind of fluid in which waves could develop. And now we were working with Terence Sanowski and Lyle Mahler's groups to see if we can sort of um, sort of model this better. And um, I want to emphasize again that this is an interesting hybrid or a combination of this variational autoencoder and this equivariance, which I introduced in the beginning. Um, so there is an encoder model like before, and now there's also dynamics models over time. So there is the dynamics in the world and there's the dynamics in the hidden space. And then there's a decoder model like in the VAE. Um, but we also have this dynamics basically. And these are the symmetry transformations um, or the transformations in the world and the transformations in your hidden space. And we want this particular diagram to close and we will call that generalized equivariance. Now the idea is that what we're going to do is we're gonna put a model with lots of parameters in this hidden space that would generate these waves um, and would sort of be a model of what you could call a liquid. And we were inspired by, um, by this um, particular, I'm not sure if I have the reference, but there's a paper um, by Constantine Rusch and his supervisor, um, where basically the hidden space, so you can think of this as a, as a neuron, and you can think of this, this vertical thing as the state of the neuron. These neurons are sort of connected topographically um, on a two or three dimensional space. Um, and they, they, they look like uh, that they are connected like with a, with a spring or, a, or an elastic uh, connection. Um, and it's a second order differential equation. If you want waves, you probably want second order equations where, the, where there is the update on the state basically given by the velocity and the update of the velocity given by a whole bunch of terms. Uh, there is the driving turn from the input there's a bias term. There's a, two convolutions, one on the velocity and one on the actual state. And then there is damping terms. And that's sort of the, the dynamics of that looks a little bit like that. And the idea would be that if I take my input data and I transform it in this particular way through sort of rotations or translations on the input, and then I encode it into a hidden space, that the sort of the transformation in the hidden space would look like, you know, these waves that are developing um, in your hidden space. Okay, so that was the idea. Um, and now let's see what happens. So um, sort of, um, I also want to make the connection to maybe um, the um, the equivariance a little bit better. So um, so let's say I take an image of a five, I map it into my latent space, and it looks like this. Then my model, um, given by you know these, these wave equations or these um, transformations, look a bit like a velocity field. So for every point in space, you have some kind of velocity that moves the particular probability mass at that point along this velocity vector, and so uh, that will start moving these these sort of um, activations in the brain to some other state, and then we decode it back. And that would should then give sort of a rotated five, right? So this is the process by you take a five, you encode it, um, the hidden states waves as wave propagation, and then you decode it, and you'll get a rotation on your on your um, image. And so it is a bit like equivariance because um, if you take your input and you rotate it, and then you map it, uh, it's the same as first mapping it and then you know transforming it into your latent space according to this T prime, which is this, this transformation here. Um, and what we were doing is we were testing this. Um, and um, I just want to say a few words about the neuroscience um, of this a bit, uh, which is, so in the brain, in the visual cortex, you will find that the neurons are uh, tuned to particular orientation. So they get extra excited if they look at certain orientations. Um, and these patterns look a bit like this. So it's like they're here's blue is one orientation, and green is an orientation, and yellow is an orientation. So these are um, 
clustered in some sense. Um, and so what we basically did is, well, we we took a um, we took a our model, and our model has in the latent space develops these waves like this, and then um, when you've been doing a lot of training, you would then look at what would the neurons that are in that particular space now be sensitive to? In what direction would their velocity fields, for instance, point? And you would find that these orientations um, are clustered in a very similar way or organized topographically in a very similar way as the ones that you'll find in the actual brain, um, including these interesting pinwheel structures. These pinwheel structures like here are topological defects in, in a physics theory, there would be topological defects um, where, let's say, the orientation uh, sensitivity sort of is, it becomes a singularity, um, and you would find these in this theory as well. So there is some interesting connection to neuroscience, but a lot of that needs to be um, unearthed still. And so the final part of the talk, I want to talk a little bit about um, how this idea can be mapped onto some new way to think about disentangled representations, right? So people really want disentangled representations because it sort of factorizes the, um, you know, the causes, if you wish, the factors that that um, that we use to think about the world into different neurons. So the idea would be that there's one neuron that, you know, deals with uh, basically a person that you know, and then another neuron that think that that um, that is another concept, maybe how the transformation happens in the world. So there's all these neurons which which sort of map onto abstract concepts and abstract factors in the world, and they might sort of be combined in interesting ways to generate the actual world. Um, and so the way we think about this is, so let's say that um, I have some image in the world and I'm seeing a certain sequence. So this particular sequence has a lot of transformations in it. First, it changes color here, and then it changes uh, orientation, and it changes scale. And I'm observing um, in the real world lots of these transformations in some, you know, they're in some combined way um, and some random way that that I don't have a lot of control over. Now I'm going to map this um, all of these images to a latent space, so they they become a point in a latent space. This is the red dot. This is very similar to before. But now in addition to that, I'm going to learn a bunch of vectors, which are the velocity fields. And they tell me how to transform the image if I want to apply this, you know, a particular symmetry transformation to it. So for instance, there is one vector to, um, you know, to uh, change color, right? This would be this one. And then there is another vector which, which I would apply um, to change orientation, and there will be another vector that would I would follow if I want to change scale. And I want to learn this is called a tangent space um, in this latent space. And these um, and at every point, I want to sort of take some linear combination of these vectors to model a um, sort of a, a symmetry transformation. And the and the big question is, can we can we learn sort of this tangent representation as well? Um, so we've been experimenting with this. Um, I want to mention that there is a beautiful analogy. Um, actually, this this is a mathematical paper, so it's more than an analogy, but it's a, a mapping that basically maps computational fluid mechanics onto um, optimal transport problem, and you can think of this as an optimal transport problem in this space. Um, the way we model again the um, the sort of transformations in the hidden space is by this Fokker-Planck equation, um, which is the same as the uh, um, Langevin equation. Uh, perhaps in this case without the noise, but you can easily add the noise to it. Um, and so you can think of this really as a fluid. So you can see, really think of this as the hidden activations in your brain as governed by fluid dynamics. Um, and we've been uh, you know, training these models by basically giving it uh, sort of these symmetry transformations on the input and then asking it to, to basically reproduce these sequences in the input space. Um, and then you can see things that um, it will learn to be able, you know, if you then start generating, you said, well, first take an image and then rotate and, and then change the color, or first, you know, change the whole hue and then change the object hue of an image. It can do all these things now because it disentangled these particular symmetries and it's, it's modeled this. It could even do more. Um, it could actually 
um, do now linear combinations of these as well. So if you once you've trained this model, you know what these vectors are, you can ask it to change both scale and object hue, or both wall hue and floor hues. You can change linear combinations of these symmetries, and it will then beautifully generate images where it will sort of change all these things separately. So it is under. So this is what I now think about as disentanglement. It's understood how to change the image um, in sort of these these different symmetries in these in these different ways. Um, and we are currently looking at um, fully unsupervised training of this. So currently we are guiding this process by telling it either uh, what the symmetry transformation is or by um, at least having symmetry transformations which are clean. We are now telling, giving it arbitrary transformations which are combinations of these things and letting it factor, factor. Uh, figure out precisely you know, what will be a good way to disentangle that. And we're also trying uh, quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics is also a form, if you wish, of this kind of Fokker-Planck equation. Uh, we're also using quantum mechanics um, to model these transformations in this hidden space. And it's sort of a version of the Fokker-Planck equation, but uh, slightly more complicated with non-local interactions. OK, so I'm, I'm um, almost done. Um, so I want to first point out that I feel that there is a huge opportunity ahead of us um, in the field of AI plus science, where we have arrows in both directions. AI can help science, but science can also help AI. Um, the reason I think is um, that there, the, these, these fields, these uh, scientific fields, condensed matter physics and computational chemistry and molecular biology have, have, have matured. They are very mature fields at this point. Um, but also, of course, the, um, the modeling fields have, have been have matured a lot, like computational science, where people do simulations, machine learning, and in the future, hopefully, also quantum computing, which is very relevant for this. And then there is these application areas. These have a very large social impact, like sustainability, um, an energy transition, and um, and health, um, that are pulling on these on this particular on this particular field. And we will see a lot more investment, right? And well, this could lead to a new era where we could um, basically generate or design materials on demand. Now, we've named the eras in which humanity lived after our materials, right? The Bronze Age and the Iron Age, etc. We probably live in the Plastic Age now. But you could imagine that, um, in fact, we could just imagine any particular material with any particular properties and then have a kind of a search engine that tries to design this particular material for us. Um, so I believe there is a very rich synergy between AI and the natural sciences. It's a very exciting application area also for machine learning. Um, now, for instance, examples are molecular generation models. Um, if we talk about AI for science and diffusion to model brain dynamics, which I talked about um, when we talk about science for AI. Um, and again, I want to emphasize there's beautiful applications which have large societal impact in both climate science and healthcare uh, for new materials and catalysts, for instance, to capture carbon out of the air or, um, or to accelerate reactions that you're interested in, maybe for fertilization production, um, to develop new drugs and vaccines uh, by you know, generating molecules with certain properties that fit in pockets that can neutralize uh, disease vectors. Um, and I've also um, uh, said a few things about uh, prediction of the weather, in which case these models have already been very successful. I've seen uh, meteorology offices become very excited about this, um, where we can predict the weather about 10,000 times faster with these models at no cost to um, accuracy. Um, and with that, I hope I'm within time, um, and I will stop there uh, for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Max Welling. Uh, that was very informative. Uh, he talked about the correlations between AI and science and how it can mutually benefit one another. Thank you very much once again. And uh, given the limited time we have, we will not be able to receive any questions from the floor. But once again, thank you very much, Professor Max Welling. Thank you. 
And that concludes uh, the last keynote speech of this conference. And uh, over the two days of conference, we were able to see how AI can be applied in different sectors. And it was amazing to see the potential of artificial intelligence. Uh, it will be followed by panel discussion starting at 14.55. Five, two, three. So we'll see you again after our break time. Thank you very much. All right, so time to move on to our panel discussion, perhaps the most awaited uh, parts of this conference, I would say. Uh, looking forward to fruitful discussions. Uh, for this part, Professor Min Su Cho will be moderator, and he'll be, they will be talking about looking back to and look forward to artificial intelligence. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Min Su Cho with a big round of applause. Okay, so we have excellent panelists today. So the first panelist I'd like to introduce is Professor Zhang Pongs. Uh, then uh, Professor Klaus Robert Müller. Uh, Professor Irfan Asa. And uh, Professor Ho Young Han. Uh, yeah, let's get started. So uh, when I uh, was asked to uh, organize a panel discussion like this, so I decided to exploit this chance to uh, satisfy my own uh, interest, not yours. <laughs> so I was thinking, uh, what I like except for doing research. So what comes to my mind was uh, drinking, uh, but uh, it doesn't fit to the summit, as you know. So the next one that comes to, to my mind was uh, the history. Uh, so I'm, I'm not good at uh, remembering something, but uh, I like to listen to interesting story. Uh, they, they experienced from some senior people uh, that our generation do not remember. So I thought, yeah, some might like it as well. Uh, so uh, I've chosen these people as a panelist, uh, you know, this excellent three uh, plenary speakers. So uh, Irfan Osa and Klaus Robert Miller and Zhang Pongs, and a special guest, Professor Po Han from SNU. Uh, so and I made this title, uh, Looking Back to Look Forward to Artificial Intelligence. So uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank all of them uh, for accepting my invitation. Uh, please welcome them. Uh, so the title implies uh, this panel discussion will uh, think about the lessons about uh, some past that may have a big implication on the future of AI, grappling with some questions such as what classic work of AI should be uh, reconsidered or remembered uh, by AI researchers and developers today, uh, and how past successes and failures uh, are able to help us to address the challenges uh, these days. So I'd like to start with a five minute initial remark uh, from each panelist one by one. Uh, I suggest to start uh, with uh, uh, Zhang, <laughs> yeah, who looks like having you know a lot of interesting stories. Yeah, you can go to the podium and you can use the slide. Yeah. Hi. So yeah, I, I prepared a few slides about the past and not the future, just the past. Um, and I guess the message that. I don't read enough papers, but I think it's important to, to read some papers. So, so most of you have probably heard about these papers. Um, they are famous. The perceptron is the, the great ancestor of the neural networks. And the neocognitron is sometimes seen as a precursor for, for, um, for CNNs. 
And uh, actually, I, I had never read those papers until a couple of weeks ago. And I thought that in the perceptron paper, I would find the famous perceptron algorithm. But there's no perceptron algorithm in the perceptron paper. There's a vague outline of saying that you could, you could use some feedback to, to do uh, supervised learning. But it's also what's in interesting is that it gives, it doesn't give the algorithm, but it says it can do unsupervised learning as well. It can be used to do digit recognition. So I thought that was interesting. And, and if, if you don't read the paper, you'll never know that. You will just speak about what you hear about these papers, but you will never know that. Then the same week, I read the neocognitron paper. I never read it. And it's interesting if you read it because, uh, of course, uh, if, if you don't know that paper, this is very, very close to uh, convolu convolutional neural networks. It's basically the same architecture, except that it has, on top of it, some extra neurons, some in inhibitory signals. And the other thing that's interesting is that instead of the 10H uh, or the sigmoid uh, nonlinearity that is used in CNN, that were used in CNN, it's, a, it's actually using the, the ReLU, I never know how to pronounce it. It's actually using the ReLU, which is interesting because the ReLU was, was claimed as one of the main innovation in the LXNet paper. And so, but this is 1980. What is interesting as well is that People often said that the neo convolution was great, so like CNN, but there was no learning algorithm. There was. It was doing unsupervised learning. It's not really described, they didn't really, really describe how they do it in the paper, but this is an example of you know, automated clustering uh, done by the neocognitron. And that, again, if you don't read the paper, you will never find. So, so I encourage you to, to, to go and read those papers. Um, so you probably all have heard about the uh, LeNet 5 paper from uh, Leca and his colleagues in 1998. And you probably all, all have read about the LXNet paper by uh, Krzyzewski, uh, I don't know if I pronounce his name right, but Krzyzewski in 2012. And probably you, you know that the, the two architecture are essentially the same except for this ReLU thing and the fact that they were using blah, 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 GPUs and all that. But, and many papers, people have actually read these papers, including the LeNet 5 paper, but most people haven't read the full paper. The first half is about CNNs, but the second half is about graph transformer model networks. It has nothing to do with uh, modern transformers, but it's a rather complicated architecture for doing uh, uh, word segmentation, word reading. And again, you need to read the paper to, to, to know that. And people read, even read the paper, but they don't read the second half. So I encourage you, I encourage you to do it. Um, I, I would like to, I don't know how to, I would like to click on the individual videos, but it, otherwise it doesn't matter. So another thing is, uh, what about uh, shape and depth perception? So nerves are very popular nowadays. And um, if I could click, I would show you the video of the nerves on the left, and they work really great. And uh, it's a very clever idea. And I think it's a very clever idea because uh, using neural networks to represent complicated shapes is a good idea. Uh, meshing doesn't work for in, on 3D data. So that, that's a very clever idea. But if you actually look at uh, videos generated from NERF, you look at this NERF Busters paper from this year's ACCV, you'll see that often if, you, if, if the, the viewpoint that you are using is not very close to the input viewpoint, you get a bunch of stuff floating in the air. You get wrong reconstruction and all that. It doesn't take anything away from the paper, but it should suggest that you remember that there are other methods that work. For example, Photogrammetry. So if, if I wish I could show you the video, this is a video of the, the Grand uh, Ducal Palace in Venice done using photogrammetry, not using Colmap or something like that, using a, um, a commercial software from capturing reality. And this thing is not perfect, but it's pretty perfect. You get an excellent reconstruction, much superior to anything I've seen from NERF. Again, nothing against NERF. It's just remember that there are other other um, technologies, things that have existed for a while. Um, I, I want to say a few words about depth perception as well. So uh, you all know that we have two eyes and we use two eyes to stereo. Okay. Um, do you know? Do you know why? Do you know why we see TV as flat? Think about it for a second. But before I get into that, most people haven't read um, Elmo's big, huge book, Physiological Optics. But when I, I read the part about stereo, I thought, because in, in computer vision, we have been doing stereo vision for a long, long time, and we measure absolute depth. So I thought that people were excellent at measuring absolute depth. They are not. 
And almost experiments showed that. And I think they've been, uh, they've been kind of re revised by modern psychologists. But in, in most reports, you can, can make mistakes as much as 50% in depth estimation. And it's actually something where people are better than computers. It's measuring absolute depth. People are very good at measuring relative depth. Again, how do you know that? You, got, you have to go and read these old, these old, these old books. Um, so the reason why we see um, the, the TV as flat is because actually we do have stereo. So since the pictures are on the flat screen, we see it as flat. But uh, another thing that's interesting, people should read Yulish's book. In, and this, Yulish invented random dot stereograms, as you see, and showed that people can fuse them even though there's no molecular interpretation that's possible. And so it's, it's an important book because it, it shows a, a scientific theory about one of the few scientific variables of things fit in our, in, our, in, our, in our brain. But another thing that's interesting in that book, they talk about this paper, most people haven't heard about it, I think. It's about uh, an, a, 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 a person with photographic memory. So there was a subject that supposedly was able to look at one of the pair in the stereogram, not the other pair, come back the next day, see the, see the second photograph in the stereogram, and fuse it. And if this is real, this is quite amazing, right? Because that, that must say something about the brain of these people. I think it's probably not real, but it was convincing enough that it convinced Yulesh, and if you read this book, you will find a chapter about where it has pictures, you can test yourself for this capacity. Again, you find that by reading this thing. And I want to conclude by Talking about two people you guys might not know, we are, or I hope you do, but if you don't know, you are learning about them, is Jan Kunrink and Andrea Van Dorn, who are two great scientists that have done a lot about visual perception. And I'm going to give you an example of what they have done. This is a, a picture of uh, Charles I, the King of England. Um, it's portrayed by Van Dyck, and they wanted to test whether people were capable of saying something about shape from a single image. And so what they did, they invented a device where you give a subject, you give him two buttons, and with these two buttons, you can adjust your ellipse like that with the stick sticking out of it, at least until it looks like it's aligned with the, with the surface. Then you erase it, you pop up another one somewhere else, and you ask the same thing to the, the subject, and you do it a few hundred times. And this gives you a normal field, because if you assume that those are circles painted on a surface, those are this gives you a normal field. This normal field you can actually integrate and you get pretty good free reconstruction of the face. So all I'm trying to say is read Kundering. And this is from Kundering, of course, and Van Dorn. This is the, the portrait I was showing you is actually from a triptych that Van Dyck did for Charles I, because Charles I wanted to have his bust made by Bernini. But Bernini was in, in, in Rome, not in London. So Van Dyck did this triptych. Oops. Ah, it's OK. Did this triptych. And then Bernini sculpted the bust from that. And to conclude, uh, let's not forget our, the giants of the field. Those are, I took as example the three honorary chairs we had for ICCV, Olivier Fogeras, Katsushi Ekeuchi, Joe Mundi. Read what they have done. Read about the older people and, and the scientists that have preceded us. I think that's good advice. And I will stop there. I'm sorry I've been way too long. Uh, thank you for the nice talk, John. Uh, Klaus, could you? Take the next uh, turn. Okay. So, is it working? Is it working? Okay, good. Um, yeah, I think the, the reason why I'm sitting here is because I'm old, right? <laughs> uh, and so this is, uh, you know, it's a proof, right? Anyway, um, so let me just digest this a bit. So I think... Um, if we look into the past, we actually find really gems of research. So you mentioned some of them. And um, I, I remember one of my uh, former PhD students, he, he came to my office uh, many years ago, uh, very excited. Um, Andreas Zier was his name. And he, he was uh, showing me uh, a conference proceedings. Um, and this was from the... I think early 70s, and um, on, of a pattern recognition conference. 
And he was not showing me the cover, but he was just showing me some papers. And uh, I realized that, that you know, Tom Cover and Duda and Hart and, and many of the heroes of the field did publish in this conference. And, um, and I took, uh, so, so I, I took the advice of my PhD student to actually read these papers. And, and I got a lot out of it. I, I thought, well, if these guys would have had the computers that we have now, I mean, there would have been nothing left for us to do, right? Um, but uh, so there's a, the, that luck that they didn't have the computers. But saying that, um, I remember that, you know, in, in my times, um, it was actually not so easy to, to test some idea very quickly. So, so I think just to give an impression, uh, you know, uh, system administrators would uh, regularly reboot the computer systems like it is now. And so this gives the maximum time that you have for doing your simulation. And so, so given that, that uh, you, know, you know, I was there, uh, uh, you know, using the first kind of workstations, it, it you couldn't do so much, so you would have to think very closely before you did your experiment what you would expect because you couldn't do an infinite amount of them. And so I think that that uh, was a good education to actually, you know, very much focus on on what you want to do and and how you want to do it. So um, just I have been part of neural nets uh, since '89. Um, and then, you know, this became kernels, and I was not totally innocent about this. And then uh, deep nets came back. And practically, I, I was using all these methods always, right? So, so the, the thing is uh, that, that a lot of people, they, um, you know, see one hype coming, and then, then everybody's just rushing towards this. But, but the nice thing about these, these other methods, these older methods, is that they still work, and they still work very well. So I think it's, it's useful to think about this as a big toolbox, and you know, sometimes you know, not every problem is a nail, right? So there's, there's more tools in your toolbox, and that's useful. And uh, I think this sense of pragmatism um, is, is very important. So, so not every problem in the world can be solved by a transformer or deep model. So you can actually have linear models that are pretty good. So, so don't uh, forget this part. Um, so also, you know, a, a lot of people um, ask me at, at different points, why did, you know, kernels come and neural networks go? And why did neural networks come and kernels go, right? There's, of course, lots of uh, uh, possible explanations for this, but one of the interesting ones is people just got bored. They got bored doing the same thing. And this was the reason why neural networks went away, because this was too, you know, people did too little progress, too little, um, you know, bells and whistles to some algorithms. And then kernels came, and you could do something new, and then, then again, deep deep models came and there are many new architectures, many new paradigms. And, um, and there's a danger, in particular if you're an older professor and you've been through different phases of this, so there's a danger of you saying, well, this has been there before. And it really requires looking at the details. Some of the things have been reinvented, um, like ReLUs um, or, uh, you know, Something like being no normalizing your your uh, um, inputs or normalizing your your uh, uh, you know uh, representation that that has been there for since the 90s or you know skip skip connections they they have been called shortcut connections so I I think it's it's like every generation invents a new set of words. But there are some very fundamental, interesting new ideas, and it takes energy and time and um, you know details to really appreciate them. 
and I uh, I think it's 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 really worth the time. Um, so I think um, what I also saw was a process of a democratization of access to AI. So in 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 you know eighty nine you had to program yourself uh, yourself everything. So you had to actually take the derivatives and code them up. Um, and so then there were so first simulation tools, but they would never do what you wanted to do. And then, um, you know, then some frameworks came like PyTorch and TensorFlow. This is more like the fast forward now. Um, and a lot of people could do things very quickly. You know, teams can, can uh, bring out a, a project uh, that goes live in nine months or so, right? And then the foundations models came, and if you know what you're doing, then, then you can get things live within days. So th this is a huge uh, progress in terms of democratization. And, and so even people who are not super experts in the details and the theory of machine learning can, can uh, use these methods. So I think um, if we come to challenges, I think um, uh, a lot of the work um, that people are uh, pursuing is scaling models up, having more and more parameters, and it's a more an engineering effort. Um, uh, and I think there's really a, a possibility to contribute uh, also in understanding them, having a better understanding, so that's X, the XAI side. And perhaps just scaling up things is not the answer to everything. So curating data sets is, a, is an important thing, aligning with cognition and, and bringing in prior knowledge. Um, and so in particular, if we think about the sciences, uh, then you know we typically have small data situation and where this understanding and where putting in knowledge inside is really, really most important because otherwise we cannot progress. So the other thing is if we interact with the sciences is that um, I think it's, it's really, I mean, I think modern science makes most progress at the boundaries of each science or between the sciences. So at this interdisciplinary uh, point. And I think that there's a risk for young people because, um, you know, if you want to be get, get a professorship in, in most countries, uh, departments are quite conservative. So, so you may be between math and computer science and the mathematician point you to the computer scientists and the vice versa. So this is really a challenge, and, but I think this should not prevent us from doing interdisciplinary research. Just we need to be aware of the risk. And um, I think one of the things that has been driving me very much um, has been you know, the, the urge to impress my kids, right? Because they come at different ages and they ask, what are you doing, right? And then you need to, to give them so, a good answer. So, so and they would ask, what are you doing to make this planet better, right? And I think there's a, uh, we cannot give them formulas because they may not be appreciated, uh, appreciative of that at, at some point. Ages. So I think it's it's a challenge to to be able to give good answers to that, and um, I think uh, yeah, I will stop with that. Okay, Klaus, thank you uh, for the interesting you know episode and uh, wise advice. So then, uh, Orfan, could you uh, give a speech? Does this work? I guess it works. Uh, I, well, I can go to the slide deck. Okay, so I actually uh, last minute made some slides. See if those work at all. Um, thank you so much for everything again. Uh, okay, next. So I showed this last time too. I mean, just a kind of a quick overview of the history of AI. Uh, and here you see a lot of different types of things that kind of have start fast progressing uh, through the discipline. But again, remembering back that you know, it's still a nascent field, and I think even some of the stuff that uh, Jean pointed out was some of the foundational stuff that people were trying to understand about human vision system that they could actually then try to understand of mimicking this into a computing process. So a lot of different elements go in here, 
And in this chart, when I was looking at it, there's a lot of things about natural software and all that kind of stuff, language modeling, and then, of course, importance of things like uh, you know, how uh, neural networks came in and scaled everything up. So there's a whole lot of that stuff here. But the reason to look at that is kind of understand how things are evolving. And you know, my take on a whole lot of these things is I'd take a rather practical approach. That is that let's figure out what problems need to be solved and then figure out the technology to bring in. And sometimes you don't want to fit a uh, square peg in a round hole, you want to really figure out the best possible thing. And I think that goes correctly in saying is sometimes linear models work. Why would you want to find a deep model to do it? Uh, just to kind of go through this, but I want to actually also point out one thing about the history of this thing. So this is something which I also stated earlier. Uh, we tend to overestimate the effect of a technology in the short run and underestimate the effect in the long run. And that's something to really think a lot about for AI especially. Uh, if you look at even the Wikipedia page for AI, it has started kind of saying things like, oh, AI doesn't work on things like OCR anymore. Because we basically, once it starts working, we kind of start saying, oh, it's not us anymore, and we take less credit for it. And the history says we should be taking more credit for these types of things, because that helps us. But building on this one, and this is where the hype comes in, uh, but at the same time, something to note from history. So this is a thing that you may have, some of you may have known about this or not, in 1966, the belief was computer vision is going to be a one summer project. Uh, we're still working at it how many years later? And it's still a really hard problem. So that kind of starts saying is that overall, we're really good at solving some hard problems, but we're also really bad at scoping out the scope of these types of problems. This is one extreme example, and I have heard from many people that Marvin Minsky was just said to Seymour Papert was, oh, take a camera, attach it to a computer, and there you'll have a computer vision system. Uh, and you know, again, that was not true. So there are lots of different types of things. This earliest project was supposed to be one summer. This is a hilarious document to read, uh, which basically even basically talks about how to do things like foreground, background segmentation in a month and then using that to do object detection. Uh, I mean, you know, that's the scale of types of things, and many people are still working on those types of things. But this is kind of things where go wrong, and this is where I kind of always say is prediction is really hard. I, lo I don't like to make predictions myself. Uh, I'd like to control those predictions, and one of the ways to control those predictions is try to create it or invent it. But we are also researchers. We're supposed to be working on unknowns. If we knew what we were doing, it wouldn't be called research. I mean, these are quotes from well-known people. So having said that, I mean, here's one quote that I'm actually, uh, I like to give, and that are surprises that we need to kind of start looking at. And what I'd like to kind of propose is that we need to start thinking about how AI is going to change everything, right? So, and that's the kind of the impact of AI, but we also have to start thinking about how to build it. Uh, as pointed out, uh, when you set up a question about the history of AI and you bring in a whole lot of old people, we find all of the oldest things in the world to talk about. But there are a few surprises for me. So one of the biggest surprises in the research world is how archive works. I cannot understand it to this date as to how archive works. And that actually has now allowed us to have a real issue around uh, dealing with short-term to long-term research issues. Now, yes. There are papers available in archive from not 1960s yet, unless somebody starts putting them. But these days, all of the students, young people in this room, you're finding papers from yesterday and the day before, maybe six months. And historical context is kind of not there as much. People have thought about these ideas. And at the same time, we have not actually internalized a whole lot of these types of questions about what are the big issues in this one. Uh, with that, I'm happy to have more conversation afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Rupan. And then finally, yeah, Po Young Han, could you? Yeah. Um, actually, I, I, I think the classical technique is very important for future study, but uh, it was very difficult to find the, the reason why we have to learn the classical you know, techniques. So 
So if I knew the title of this panel, the panel discussion session when I invite when, when I was invited, maybe <laughs> I reject I, I I declined the the invitation. So, but anyway, so I I try to find the 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 good region to study the, the classical studies. So I listed some you know technical stuff in in this slide. In computer vision side, I think the geometric computer vision is very important. Okay, the geometric computer vision is still based on the mathematical stuff. Okay, when we solve the 3D problems, camera calibration, multiple geometry such as the homography, the the fundamental matrix, trifocal tensors, it, uh, geometric stuff are based on the mathematical uh, mathematics. So uh, still we have to study, you know, the geometries to uh, solve the, the 3D vision problems. Okay. The next one is the problems with insuff insufficient data. Okay. So the, basically the deep learning is based on a lot of data, training data. Uh, however, in many uh, uh, real world problems, uh, the amount of the data, the typically very small. Okay. If the data, uh, size of the data set is small, uh, it's very difficult to learn a model or, or the learned model have a lot of errors. Okay? So probably the, the traditional the computer vision or machine learning techniques can you know, reduce the error the incurred by the learned models. So maybe the extreme of the insu insufficient data is unsupervised learning. So we still the, use a lot of the uh, unsupervised learning techniques so the, the uh, one example is the clustering. So even though the, the deep learning is very prevalent, so we still rely on the traditional the clustering algorithms, such as very simple k-means clustering, mean shift, label propagation, or graph-based method. Okay. So that's another the example. So another, uh, the, next the next one is the optimal algorithms. Um, there are several the optimal the method can solve a certain problem, certain class of uh, classes of the problems. For example, the Kalman filter is optimal the, with the linear dynamics and the observations. The, also, the bleed propagation the provide the optimal solution uh, in the tree like the graphical models. Okay? So since the, the, those techniques provide the optimal solution, we don't have any reason to use the deep learning. Also, the, when we design a network, uh, we can use strong uh, prior uh, to, to, to the design the network architecture or loss functions. Okay? So the, uh, the, the loss functions, the motivate by some the physical law or common sense, the probably a good, uh, the good choice for the loss function. Also, uh, I think the domain specific data processing is very important. Okay? The success in, uh, success in computer vision and natural language processing, the based on deep learning. Okay? That's only part of the, the problem solving. I think the most of the problems, the 80% of the problem is, uh, uh, is about how to the process, pre-process data, and the rest of the 20% is about the learning and modeling. Okay? So the, our success it's only about the, the last part, the last 20% of the, the problems. We still, in, in many cases, we still don't know how to solve the problem for the first 80%. So the, uh, to, to, for the, the better processing of the data, the domain knowledge, and some traditional, uh, and traditional uh, study, uh, they are very important, I guess. Uh, also, uh, the studying and learning the traditional classical techniques, I think that it's very important to the, the develop of a creative idea and address the, the challenges and make more advanced algorithms. So I think the students, I mean the graduate students especially, uh, should study the, the, classical, the classical algorithms uh, and, uh, and they have to develop their, their, their talent in a balanced way between a scientific side and engineering side, okay? I think the, these days the most of the students probably the focus more on the engineering side. Uh, 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 then I would recommend to, you know, the, the make the balance between the two items. Okay, that's it. Thank you, Wayman. 
I'd like to thank all the uh, panelists for delivering uh, very nice and distinct uh, ideas about uh, this topic. Uh, actually, I like uh, this panel discussion you know, more spontaneous because uh, this is my first time to organize <laughs> and moderate this panel discussion. And uh, maybe uh, it would be better to interact with uh, maybe some uh, audiences here as well. But maybe uh, to, uh, to take a time for audience to prepare their questions. So we may start with uh, some specific questions about our uh, initial remarks. So my uh, first question to ask is, um, you know, this is a question to every panelist. So uh, whose opinion do you think uh, you are most agree with? And if you have anything to add, maybe you could uh, give a few words about that. So can you uh, 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 speak, you know, John, could you uh, have any idea about, you know, what would be the, yeah, any, any opinion, yeah. You mean the opinions that have been expressed, yep. yeah. I, I, I'm pretty much, um, you know, I'm, I pretty much agree with people. I'm, I'm pretty much most in in uh, agreement with my own opinion, I guess. But it's just a joke. But yeah, no, I don't know what to say about that. I, you know, I think all I heard was uh, quite quite correct. So. Did anyone, Orphan, do you uh, have any particular opinion you want to add? Things, or one yeah. of the things that's always interesting is when everybody agrees, it gets to be a very boring panel. Uh, so we should disagree just to the make it uh, interesting. No, I'm just joking. I, I, there's nothing I can disagree with. But the bottom line is that in, in this context of what we're talking about, we're basically saying, among other things, is there is a strong uh, backbone to a whole lot of these things that we should look at. But I'll give you a, a counter perspective that was also expressed to me by somebody a long time ago when I was a student. It was Mitch Tenenbaum when we was at this panel at MIT. And he basically came and told us, and this was the early days of AI, by the way, at the AI lab. Uh, and he said, "Is you folks can all go to sleep or go to a beach for the last 20 years and come back and AI will be better. And his argument was because compute power is going to solve a lot of problems. Uh, and in the example he gave was Ian Orshville used to have this robot called Polly that would move one inch, take a picture, process that picture for a while, did edge detection, and then moved one inch, uh, and basically, again, moved very slowly. And his example was, now Polly, 10 years later, runs almost real time, and it's using the same code. So, so it's somewhat related. It's, it's, it's just a remark. It's, it's like, I, I remember back around 2000. So I had seen, I had seen a talk by Anne Lequin about Planet 5 and all that, and I was blown away. And I talked to people, and, and, and of course, the, the the reason why the CNN sounded so popular at the time, not so many people knew about them. It's mostly worked for optical character recognition and for much else. But one of the re and the computer power was not so good. But the real problem is that nobody knew how to hack them. Nobody knew to, to make them work. You know, there was Jan, there was Leon Boutou, and that's Patrick Hefner, and that's it. It was very hard. And so when the, those libraries came up, then suddenly, it became easy to, to, to do stuff. And I think that's a big part of the, of, of the story and that shouldn't be forgotten, at least. And just to add to that, I mean, you know, as soon as more software, OpenCV came in, computer vision became more real. I mean, I think you mentioned even TensorFlow and uh, PyTorch, all of those things. And now we are at a stage where a student can have an idea and have a running prototype within ours. And, 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 and there's, there's a risk linked to that. I speak too much as usual. There's a risk linked to that. I tell my student, take an intro to vision class. My students don't know what fundamental metrics is anymore. They, they, they go, they take, a, they take a, a deep learning class, they take an object recognition class, and they don't know anything else. And so I'm, I'm thinking of forcing them to take an intro vision class so they get the basic knowledge, a basic knowledge base that, that often they lack nowadays, however brilliant they might be. I throw things at my students in my office if they walk up to me and basically say is, oh, I'm just try a CNN on this one. Like, no, why? Even from shape from X, you're going to do CNN. You don't even know what shape from X is. First, learn what shape from X is before you apply anything. But Klaus, you might have something to add. Well, um, I think there's something that I 
I'm starting to hate, okay? And I'm, I, I see that, that uh, computer science, uh, you know, and machine learning in particular, there was a need to compare things, right? But I think this has become, I would say, too much of an obsession. You know, I would call this the SOTA hunting um, procedure. So I think that, that uh, I, I feel that, that we are not receptible to conceptual things anymore um, unless there is a SOTA uh, table that shows that this is a bit better. So, I mean, I think, you know, looking back a bit, right? So I... Uh, when, when we try to publish kernel PCA, right, which is, uh, you know, some years ago, um, one of the reviewers rightfully said um, it's, it's a useless algorithm, right? But it was, the main point was it was a conceptual innovation and it could, one could do a lot of things with it. So I think in modern times, um, it's, it's very hard I mean, these these kind of concepts may not be, be uh, you know, finding themselves in conferences or in papers because people just say, well, why don't you compare to this and this, and it's it's worse. So I, I think that we should revise this a bit, and that's that's one thing that I hate. And the other thing, which is you know a side effect of this, is that people they, in particular, if it comes to the sciences, so people from the computer sciences, they download some data, they do something, and then they they want to publish this, and it's totally useless, right? So I think this is, um, I think the, the, I think it's good to, you know, not know about a field and just to look at it from fresh eyes, but once you have some results, I think it's important to actually put this into perspective, learn a bit from the field so that it's not totally ridiculous what, what you get, so I don't think. Uh, maybe some uh, common point that you, uh, most of you pointed out would be, I could summarize somehow this intellectual laziness, laziness because now we have a lot of data out there and lots of computing resources as well, and also this nice library everywhere, open source. So maybe this could be, We've described it as a somehow one pitfall uh, in this era of deep learning and uh, somehow, uh, you know, big large models. So, and then, uh, so what do you think? Do you, do you think some other pitfall we have nowadays in the era of, you know, generative AI and this deep learning? Do you ask me? Anyone? Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, I think the one of the P4 we are facing right now is that uh, if we have some result, okay, we I I mean that we are kind of you know the enforced to the accept the result. Actually, the result may not be correct. Okay, so we can you know analyze the result in a different way, but it is very difficult to how to interpret the, the result. So if the, uh, somebody says something, then the, that the comment may be accepted as truth, but nobody knows what the truth is. Okay? So that's the, 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 the big problem. And, and especially for the students, they, they simply, the, simply the believe what they read from the paper the, they are not necessarily true. So I think that everybody uh, should be able to criticize the, the papers more actively. Klaus, you may have some... Yeah, uh, well, I mean, I think I have, I have a bit of a fundamental problem. So, um, so we are... Um, I, I think the having foundation models is a wonderful thing, right? It has been helping people to get products out very quickly, right? Mm -hmm. At least in the e-commerce side. The problem that I see in, in um, 
in the foundation models um, is that there are some hallucinations and there are some, some things that we don't understand about them. And I think there's a fundamental problem in this because most of the models that actually w work reasonably well, they're behind some walls. So there's, they are not available to academic scrutiny. So this, by the way, is, has been um, you know, a fact that has been also around in other fields. So the field of genetics uh, was like that. There was a companies that were changing genes and plants and things, and um, there was no understanding of what happened in this context. And there was a, at some point, there was a joint understanding that, that there should be some independent scrutiny. And I think that this is not a bad idea. I don't know how to do this in the context of, of large language models or foundation models because uh, nobody has the infrastructure to actually do these analysis. So, I mean, it, we, but, but I think when we will have to think about how to, how to do this. Otherwise, we have a technology where we know that there are some pitfalls, but we don't really fully grasp them. So I think that's one thing that, that uh, I, I don't know a solution to this, but I think it's important to, to uh, properly study this. So, I mean, you know, when you speak about pitfalls, I mean, you can ask questions about pitfalls of any technology. Most technologies do have a significant amount of pitfalls. Uh, there are dangers associated with it. Uh, I'll give you one example. Uh, you know, in Africa in the early 1900s, there was a desire to build a highway to connect the south part of Africa with the north one. And of course, that resulted in very good traffic movements between the different parts of Africa. Uh, eventually, what they found out was all of a sudden that the d diseases that were in the south part of Africa were making it to the north part of Africa. So, you know, those are the kinds of pitfalls we don't predict, and that happens. And this is going to happen and has been happening uh, with AI, and especially in the context of generative AI uh, and people and deep learning. So, deep learning has, you know, among other things, is a black box. We usually do not know how it actually came to a set of decisions that it does. And in some I instances- I disagree, we have XAI, but, but- Yeah, no, no, we're working on explanation AI, and I understand that. But the point is that, you know, that requires us to come up with newer ways of addressing those challenges. And I think we need to keep on kind of thinking through this. And similarly on the, you know, generative AI, I mean, remember, we're now coming to a new world of misinformation and disinformation. Uh, and, you know, was, we have already seen the world is actually having a problem with misinformation, disinformation. In the non-deep world, the shallow world has been pretty bad with information issues. And now when we bring it this new set of technology, can we imagine what's going to happen and be ready for it? So there are significant challenges in society we need to think about. So, so I'm, I'm, by, by nature, I'm rather optimistic, so I, I, I don't think the pitfalls are that bad. And... And I think the, the, I mean, we are, I'm an old geezer and I'm giving you wisdom, but I think the field is doing pretty well. And so you shouldn't worry about it too much. I think for the generative AI and all that, you know, I'm not a specialist. I think you should be careful about the usage. I think all the, the people who tell you, you know, this is the end of the world coming and all that, I think this is a bit foolish, in my own opinion. Um, and so, you know, be optimistic and work on that. You think things will be fine. You have to be careful about usage. Um, one, one small pitfall I see in what we do is that in computer vision, at least, is that I, th I think there's, m maybe it's just me, I think there's a slight tendency to make up problems and data that are more and more, you know, convoluted and, and far from reality. I've seen things for like training robots by observing people that where well, they made you know thousands of videos where, where you see people pushing something, but in a very funny way that people would never push anything like that because they think that's the, the way the robot will do it, and 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 that work can be very, very interesting anyway. But but I think we have we have to keep in mind to there's reality out there, and we should we should probably look at problems that are really related to real life. Okay, thank you. Uh, Maybe uh, at this point, it would be better to take some questions from the audience. So uh, if you have any uh, questions relevant to you know, what we have discussed so far, so please raise your hand, then 
the microphone will be delivered. Bonus points if you raise a question that we disagree on. <laughs> yeah, that would be great as well. Uh, yeah, if you don't have now, maybe uh, please prepare. I could maybe move on to another relevant questions what we have discussed so far. So, uh, so one thing I wanted to ask you was like, uh, you know, so actually uh, everybody are talking about this hallucination problems in deep learning models, right? Especially now deep large models. So uh, do you think, uh, you know, somehow this uh, research result or ideas in the past could solve this problem, you know, in the specific, you know, specifically this uh, issue? Hallucination, uh, you said? Yeah. I, mean, I, do, do, I, I think people, uh, Say it's not hallucination, it's whatever it's called. It's, it's, it's not to hallucinate new things. You, you put plausible things instead. Mm. Uh, when you don't have any other information, I think it's mm. fine, no? I mean, the, the, the reason why they hallucinate because there's not enough. Yeah, actually, I'd like to listen from uh, actually Orphan because Orphan has very flashing uh, viewpoint about this, this uh, issue. So, in his talk, so maybe so, you may have somewhat. I mean, hallucinations can be good and bad. Uh, if you're creating some sort of a, um, let's say, a narrative or a story, uh, I mean, arguably, uh, the creative part really does require hallucinations. Being able to think, you know, go beyond, because you just don't want to be interpolating between known shapes or something, or you want to be able to generate something crazy out of it. Uh, you don't want hallucinations when you're doing AI on medical data. I mean, because if it generated something, you're going to most probably hurt somebody. Uh, you don't want hallucinations in autonomous driving uh, because it, you know, it's going to go in the wrong direction. So you have to start kind of thinking about where are these types of things. And you know, one of the biggest things uh, that is actually important in our machine learning world is the data we train on, right? I mean, it's something which we sometimes control and sometimes don't. I mean, I, I joke around. Um, that you know, when I did my PhD, it was one of the first few works on faces and facial expressions 30 years ago. It was really good at recognizing, you know, 20 year old graduate male students that were in my neighborhood of my office. All of the 20, I mean, that's what it was good at. Uh, but you know, we learned even with faces that we had to do it. But again, there's a history of these types of biased data sets uh, that has existed for a long time. And those data sets create their own biases out of it. Uh, but that's what actually, you know, bringing in a little bit more thought process to kind of deal with those types of things is important. But hallucinations in this kind of system, and again, while explainable AI is going to solve some of it, there are still black boxes out there. They are going to generate things. How do you test them? I agree with Klaus. We do not know. Uh, you must have just heard there is a whole lot of rhetoric coming uh, from the White House in US right now. Uh, of creating testing platforms. Um, I'd love to figure out how to solve those problems too. Well, actually, the, I don't know how to deal with the hallucination the, because the hallucination is the nature of the generative AI, right? The generative model is supposed to generate new stuff. That is actually hallucination. So one way to handle the hallucination is to separate the knowledge and, I mean, for in, the, in the example of the uh, language model, I think the one way to the deal with the hallucination is separate knowledge and the fluency. Okay, generative model should learn the fluency only, and if uh, if we want to some some fact from the knowledge uh, the, from the knowledge model uh, the, the language model, the language model should refer to the knowledge base to answer the question or uh, the when it tries to say something. Okay, so that, that's one way to you know handle the, the hallucination. Certainly. So actually, on this, I, I, I'm, I'm intrigued by the diffusion models, because, especially for the things of faces. So to me, the, the diffusion models for me, what they are about, they are generative models in the sense that you are supposed to be able to sample the distribution of the data that you're observing, which I think is great. I th when you take 20,000 faces and you are supposed to generate new faces, I'm skeptical. To me, if, if, if really it works, it's magic. Because to me, it seems that people look very different. They have very details. They have different expressions. And capturing that to 20,000 faces seems difficult. So do you, do you generate just the old faces with some extra detail? I don't know. And for the big models, 
You have 600 billion faces that have been put in there, or images. Do you, are, are you just you know, looking at the modes of overfitting and looking at the modes of the distribution? Or is she capturing distribution? And it's impossible to check because there are so many pictures in a data set that you cannot know if, they are, if, the, if the samples you generate are new or they are not new. It will always be a bit different, of course, from the actual samples, but it's, it's very, di very difficult, at least, to know. So I think there are intriguing questions. And so is this hallucination or remembering? Who knows? I mean, if I narrow down the question, so even if you know data are wrong somehow, having some biases, if we have better model, maybe in the training, I mean, the learning process, maybe model should discriminate uh, between this true and false data samples, and somehow it might be able to get us like uh, uh, some results without, you know, not without, but with less, much less hallucination. So I guess we could somehow think about uh, what we can bring from the past to handle this issue. So that's uh, my question. So maybe in this perspective, if you have any, uh, maybe comment. <laughs> so actually, I couldn't hear your question well, so, <laughs> so the, the, did you ask uh, the hallucination can be reduced by uh, kind of discriminating the fact or fake? Yeah, if we have very good model, uh, then uh, maybe somehow very good uh, inductive bias, it could give us... Like yeah, actually, that, like... I think that that question was, uh, the, the question was related to the, what I said earlier, so, so there may be... Uh, it is possible to design a discriminator by referring to the knowledge base whether the, the, the output of the generality model is uh, true or not. So that's, that's one the good direction. The another the benefit to you separate the, those two is that uh, maybe it's, it's possible to, you know, I mean the size of the generality model much smaller uh, because the, I mean, in, ca in the case of the language model, it can only learn the fluency. It doesn't memorize the, the, the facts in the, the training data. It just can learn the fluency. So then we can reduce the size of the model. So there's another the benefit to separate those two. Yeah. Uh, if you have any questions, please raise your hand and you can maybe engage somehow. Uh, so actually, time flies. So we have only five minutes. So maybe uh, for the final uh, somehow question, I'd like to bring this one. So, so we talk about somehow this past and the current issue, but for the future, you know, for the better uh, future, uh, better AI in, in the future. So, what do you think we have to work on? You know, maybe there could be some problems we are missing or somehow completely forgotten or uh, ignored. So do you think we have some, uh, uh, you know, very crucial problems like that? Well, I mean, I, the, the fields that I will work in the future is clearly AI for the sciences and in particular in medicine. Um, so I tend to be also a bit optimistic that we can do great things there. Uh, and so I think, uh, you know, being able to understand disease better is a, is a very worthy cause. But also um, one aspect I think is, is new materials, solar cells, batteries, catalysis. Um, there's, there's a lot to do, right? Um, and so, um, and this will keep us busy, you know, way beyond everybody's uh, retirement in the room, right? Uh, including the, the students. So, so these are hard problems, and, but they are very burning problems uh, for our planet. And we have to also put this into perspective because somehow, um, you know, the whole excitement about large language models um, has made us forget that they use quite substantial uh, compute power. And, and so, you know, we've been, we've been saying we have to keep the planet uh, stable and at the same time we're just using chat gpt all the time right or other uh, large language models so this this makes no sense okay 
So just to add, I think uh, Jean said this, and I, I'm extremely optimistic. The only uh, variant I want to put in this is that while we should be going towards artificial intelligence, perhaps our near-term goal should be augmented intelligence. And that is, can we actually make people be able to do things what they want to do uh, in a much more effective manner? So, you know, doctors can use AI to use you know, for various types of medical stuff. Uh, I mean, yes, arguably people like me and maybe Jean, among other things, are helping people just take better pictures. We should be doing a little bit more, uh, perhaps, with that kind of stuff, too, and you know, helping with imaging. I think there are lots of interesting, healthcare is one, and also a lot of different society types of things where we can just use AI to be able to help the workflow and the processes. Now, some of us have to step back and say, that's not the research I do, I'm going to still do one. But that's fine too. We are researchers. We have things we want to do. So, if I if I may add something, the, not only is it bad for the environment to do all this stuff, but also it's not so interesting to do GPU-based research. I mean, seriously, if, if if all you do is you know add more computers and you can do, of course, you can do very interesting things and like chat GPT is great and all that, but but there are other things to do than just you know. Uh, the thing and, and consume power okay. or data. Yeah. Uh, instead of you know, just changing some architectures and train the models, I, I hope that many people try to focus on some theoretical part or some application side or the low level the coding stuff. Okay. So okay, I think the effort, if the human effort can be distributed to the many sides, I think the AI can continue to advance. Uh, this is not a direct answer to your question, but I think that's, that's important. OK, it's, it's almost the uh, end. <laughs> so uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, thank you for all the yeah, interesting uh, stories and advices and comments. So it was great, Anna, to have you, you know, in these panels. And uh, you know, it would be grateful, I mean, for helping me to make this panel with a, you know, full of interesting stories. So, and then, uh, yeah, let's conclude this panel discussion now. And uh, please thank the panelists again. And, thank you. And if I, if I may add one last thing, uh, I wanted to thank you for organizing the workshop. Thank you, yeah. And the panels, and thank all the organizers. It's been great and a real honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you for the attention as well. Thank you very much, Professor Zhou. All right, so uh, four panelists and uh, Professor Zhou shared their views on AI and its future. And I believe such precious ideas and insights are and it will be a driving force for the advancement of AI-related technologies. Thank you once again to the panelists and our moderator for such an informative discussion. Uh, so that concludes all the programs that we have. But before uh, wrapping up today's conference, I would like to invite Professor Songwan Lee, the general co-chair of the summit, to give, give closing remarks. Please welcome him with a big round of applause. As we come to the close of the Korea AI Summit 2023, I want to take a moment to reflect on the valuable insights, discussions, and the connections we forged yesterday. First, I would like to express my gratitude to all of our speakers, panelists, and the presenters. Your expertise and the passion have enriched our understanding and inspired us to think beyond our boundaries. Your contributions have been the driving force behind the productive discussions we have had. I would like to thank the organizing committee and all the staff who have worked timely, tirelessly behind the scenes to ensure the seamless execution of this event. Your dedication and hard work have not gone unnoticed, and it's because of your efforts that this conference has been such a well-organized and enlightening experience. In conclusion, 
I encourage you all to continue to engage, share, and innovate, and not to forget the connections we have made, the knowledge we have gained, and the potential for future collaboration. Thank you all once again for your participation and dedication to the success of this conference. I look forward to our paths crossing again in the future. Safe travels and best of luck with all your future endeavors. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Lee, for your valuable remarks. Now we're almost towards the end of the conference. During the two-day program, uh, we affirmed, reaffirmed how AI technology can empower and enrich our humanity as well as our lives. And by inviting uh, global experts in the field of AI, we were able to see the potential of AI and realize how important it is to nurture talents to power the nation. And on behalf of the organizer, I would once again would like to thank everyone for coming to, to, to this conference. And also, I hope uh, this conference offered quality programs to meet up your expectations. I hope uh, to see you again next year. And I thank you very much for your valuable time and attendance. This has been Jessica Park. Thank you very much, everyone.